Hello again, friends, and you by Cracky indeed are our friends. Welcome to the Jim Cornette Experience, where today we'll have salutations and observations, historical tidbits, and modern sh fits about pro wrestling. This show is going to be either free and easy or cheap and sloppy. You make the call. And to join me, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you. He's an expensive co-host, but you get what you pay for. The great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again, bright and early. And are we free and easy or are we cheap and sloppy today? That is the question to be answered. It's a thin line. Between. It's a thin line between <laughs> it's a thin line between free and cheap and easy and sloppy. <laughs> We will attempt to skirt that line, potentially up on a tighter wire. Uh, here, okay. Let me ask you this. <laughs> We're starting off so well here. You know, we just, we should have hit upon this formula long ago because people have been raving about the, uh, the drive through episode that we just finally released this week after my hell week uh with the internet situation and and whatnot uh that we just had so much fun and is it just because we've just completely given up and we don't give a shit because we're so far out of whack with what we're supposed to be doing at this point yeah yeah i think so i think wrestling just right. made us delirious and now we just no, Delirious has a great wrestling mind. I worked with him for quite a while. <laughs> and no, okay, so what happened? With, obviously, we mentioned on the drive through the people missed me on a, for a few days on, on the social medias uh, because I had no internet here at the castle for a couple of days, first two days this week. It threw off our recording schedule, so we finally got to drive through, recorded, finished sometime on Wednesday, got it out on Thursday. On Thursday, I then had to do a marathon cameo shoot. Remember the Great American Cameo Bash? It seems so long ago and far away. It was last fucking weekend. And uh, so uh, Hotchkiss came over and, and just camped, and we did all those Thursday and finished later than normal. And then we were going to try to turn around and record this program again very early on Friday to get it out, but... I basically said, I, I can't think, and I don't, I haven't even had time to look at the news or any of these programs, don't know what the fuck, so I need a day to ring, as the, as the big cat would say, I need a day to ring my brain out, Brian Last, because what your brain is like a sponge. When it has absorbed all the knowledge it can, it must be wrung out from time. That's what Ernie would say when he was going to give up the book and go somewhere else. Uh, so... So we took that and, and you <laughs> took that. What? What? It's, it's not like he volunteered to ring out his brain. He was told, you, you better go ring out your brain somewhere else. Well, I'm bringing him Bill Dundee. <laughs> he at least made it po a positive. That's true. That's true. You know, he was doing positive things. Uh, but anyway, and th so I wrung my brain out and, and tried to prepare some things to talk about. We had distractions yesterday. There was severe weather in the area. The Monroe brothers got run out of here by heavy rain. Um, and so finally got all that together. And, we're, and now it's very early on Saturday, very early on a Saturday morning. And I've got a bunch of pieces of paper with little tidbits written down and everything. Not exactly a, uh, a, a great agenda here, but we will, we will go through things and try not to miss anything. So anyway, I get up this morning we're going to do this show, and I think, well, at least we got some rain, right? Because it's been very dry here. At the airport, 15 miles away the other day, they got an inch and a half of rain. We got eight one-hundredths of an inch. Uh, the, uh, last week, they got two inches across the river. We got one-tenth of an inch. It's been very dry right here in my particular area. So I was glad we got some good rain because that way the the lawn and the trees everything's going to be green i'll have you know brian that since march the monroe brothers as i've mentioned have been out there steadily working on things we have had the the yard from 
one end to the other raked and blown all leaves, sticks, refuse. I've had fence rows cleared in the back. We had a, the, my tree guy over, take, took a couple of old trees out, unsightly and dying trees, took them out, ground that up. Shit's been hauled off. They brought in all these 40 something tons of creek stone, done the remulched my trees and done the stone mulch cir uh, stone circles around the mulch beds. I'm at this place just yesterday as they were runoff, they were about to finish the final touches now they've got some mortar and things to do on some stone but all the yard has been cleaned up it looked like I, i'm living in a state park i'll have you know and i get up this morning and i look out the back window and the oldest tree on the property an old maple it's seen its better days most of it's been dead for a while there's been some green etc but it's just kind of been falling apart but i've let it stand there because it's weathered all these many years, might be a hundred years old. At, at one time, it was huge and full. Now it's not even really any shade, but the trunk of it, a grown man can't reach around with both his hands. And I've and the, my tree guy said, you, Corky, you, you remember Corky, my tree guy. Of course. He said, you want me to take that out? And I've, I've said several years ago, I've said, no, it's not bothering anybody. Look at it. It's still hanging on. It's got character. And it's on. It's right out. It's only fifty or sixty feet high at this point, and it's toward the back fence. But it's far enough away that if it fell, it won't hit anything. Let's let's let the old fella live out its last days, right? And finally, as soon as we get every single thing picked, every leaf, every weed, every goddamn branch picked up and hauled off and raked up and straightened out. Last night, the storm came through, and that thing just turned right over at the base, roots and all, and fell straight. Fell wow. uphill. Uphill, even. Didn't even fall downhill. Fell uphill. It didn't hit anything. The old boy had a good life, but it had perfect timing. It waited until I've dismissed everybody with a truck, everybody with chainsaws, everybody with a wood chipper. And everything, and it was like it—it—it it, it, it was almost like the scene in a Christmas story where the, the, the Christmas dinner is laid out. Everything looks beautiful, and suddenly here comes a pack of wild dogs. Now I got to get on the phone to Corky, get the wood chippers and the chainsaws and the apparatus out here, and get this giant fifty, sixty foot maple tree picked up and chipped up and hauled off well that was happy talk for you hey and speaking of happy <laughs> speaking of happy i'll have you know that i want to be the first one on national broad worldwide radio here to say happy birthday to the love of my life my sweet little harley quinn cornet who is seven years old today I'm waiting for you to say happy birthday to I Harley. I would also like to say that you indeed were the first person nationally to wish Harley Quinn happy birthday and perhaps the last person nationally. Hey! To, no, happy birthday, Harley Quinn. How old yeah. is Harley Quinn now? Six? Seven. I just said seven. seven years old. Yes. Wow. Lucky seven. She never looked better. Uh, and by the way, I'll have you know that a lot of people are going to say that. Because she is a national television star. Think about it. She gets a close-up every season of Dark Side of the Ring. She's been a, a, a vice TV celebrity for the last three years. You know, actually, funny enough, if you think of the Dark Side of the Ring airings and the reruns that were airing for whatever it was, a three-month period of time there, yeah, and AEW TV over the similar period of time. Yeah, more people saw Harley Quinn. There's... There's actually wrestlers that Harley Quinn had more screen time. Than <laughs> <laughs> Dark side of the ring. Well, that's actually, and if you, you know, we started, we haven't kept it up of, of late, but we started her Twitter account at Quinn for, for those interested, because I just wanted my dog to get more Twitter followers than shit stain. And, and, and it was, it was a while back when we started it, it was a, it was a pretty, it was a run for their money for a while. And then, 
course, he promotes his stuff shamelessly, whereas we didn't really keep up the dog's Twitter. But it, for a while, when oh. they fir- first both started, it was competitive. You're forgetting the best part when some woman hacked your dog's Twitter. And it yes. Was like, <laughs> she was offering. What was she doing? It wasn't sex services. It was. Actually, maybe it was. It was I don't service. know. Or some kind of selling <laughs> something. Trying to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what Stacey wrote. What kind of sicko are you to hack a dog's Twitter just because it had 6,000 <laughs> followers or whatever? And also, we want to say happy birthday, speaking of Twitter, to a longtime Twitter fan, Furman Torres. Happy birthday, Furman. Happy birthday, Furman. Yeah, I didn't have much time. And for everybody else who's saying, well, why are you wishing him happy birthday? And yeah, I tweeted the same thing. He didn't wish me. Well, I haven't had time to look through everything on Twitter lately because we've been rushed, as I mentioned at the top of the program. But Furman is a positive guy. He's always positive. He's always tweeting, hey, new show is released, whatever it is, drive through the experience. Hey, this is great. New show. I've got time to watch it. He's like a... A fucking uh, a, 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 a motivational speaker for our podcast. He's always pepping people up on Twitter about it. He's happy about it. That's we right. like Furman. Plus, happy he sent Furman. us $50,000 in cryptocurrency. Yeah, well, it, it, we don't know that it's worth 50 grand yet. We're still having that checked out. It fluctuates. That's true. <laughs> it does fluctuate. It fluctuates from uh, the far end of the fluctuates from the far end of the spectrum to the near end of the it's it's uh, needle goes both ways it fluctuates from left to right and then fluctuates from right back to left again fluctuate with your needle over there yeah I'm just fluctuating with the uh, speaking of needle I have some observations before we go any further uh, just random observations I've tried to catch. Little tidbits of the news, not only the regular news and the wrestling news and everything, and just little tidbits. And I guess what, Brian, I'll have you know that this came out of left field. You would have never been able to predict this in a million years. It's just shocking. Out of the blue, you'll never guess. Ever since that they have dropped pretty much nationwide all the mask mandates because they basically said if you're fully vaccinated, you don't need to wear a mask. And everybody took them off because the fucking nutcases that didn't want to wear them to begin with now had a, a excuse. And now every state in the United States of America is having a spike in cases of COVID, and it is now becoming a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Who could have ever dreamed this? That because... These people, for whatever reason, in their fucking wound-up minds, have decided to believe in the orange goof that used to run this place till he was run out of town on a rail, who downplayed it because he knew that the suckers that voted for him and he hoped would vote for him again would want him to talk about it that way because the Democrats, a.k.a. those educated, smart people... They were trying to get everybody to do what was right for society. So now every single one of those people don't have to wear a mask, and they're also not going to get vaccinated because they think that the government's trying to implant tracking devices into them or turn them into a werewolf or what it's all a plot. And so now the COVID cases are spiking in every single state. Los Angeles is already reinstating a mask mandate in public, put them back on. Because 4 million people in Los Angeles alone supposedly have a good reason for not wanting to get a free vaccination to prevent them from dying of a current pandemic that has not been cured. 90,000 new cases in 48 hours. And they've got a 30% vaccination rate in Mississippi because they don't trust them smart people in the government. Tennessee, right down below me, the cases there are up 310% in the last two weeks, and the vaccination rate is 38%. The vaccination, as we have mentioned, will not keep you from getting this. It will just keep you from dying from it. So you should get vaccinated and then stay away from slobbering people, and you'll be fine. But if you don't get vaccinated and you don't stay away from slobbering people, then you're 
still probably going to fucking catch it and die. So now we have concrete proof that Republicans are a public health menace. Those are those statistics. You know what I think would help? More sexy pharmacists. <laughs> what the- I'm sorry. I don't care if it's goddamn Jenna Jameson in her best years standing there in front of me completely naked. As soon as I'm seeing the needle, I don't care how sexy they are. I want to leave. I'm very, I'm very. Okay. But what if it was Vanessa Del Rio? Same thing. Okay. I'll make a note to come back later, Okay. but I'm not interested (laughs) right at that point. (laughs) Okay. Did you also, did you know this? I was, I've been trying to find something to listen to on television while I've been uh, uh, working and taking some notes here lately, rather than something I actually have to watch and pay attention to. So I was looking through the, the uh, guy on screen guide on the cable. These are actual television programs on what I believe is the discovery health channel. It's, it, it was like D-I-S-C-H-L-H-D, whatever the fuck. But anyway, these two programs were back-to-back on the schedule. Have you seen either one of these, these fine programs, Brian? The Boy with Bloody Tears. No, I've not seen that, no. Have not seen The Boy with Bloody <laughs> Tears? That was followed up in this, in this double feature programming. <laughs> the Man with the 80-Pound Groin. Well, now that it's out of the closet, I guess I should say it's been tough sitting here well, with my 80-pound groin. <laughs> well, but wait. <laughs> but wait, because I needed to know more, right? The, the, title, <laughs> the title didn't tell me everything I wanted to know about this program. So I hit the uh, info button and come to find out, I guess they just didn't want it. This was not a polite title, but the... So they put 80 pound groin on the episode guide, but come to find out his what's 80 pounds is his scrotum. Is was that oh, you? No, that was not me. Thank that God. wasn't you? 80 pound scrotum. The man with the 80 pound <laughs> scrotum. Wow. That's a one hour television program, folks. And we've you know, now I realize I'm not at all surprised that AEW got on television. There's something for everybody. Um Speaking of something for everybody, our old friend Rock Rims, the the incredible author of uh, When It Was Big Time, the history of Northern California wrestling, and he also did the history of Southern California wrestling, and now he has done the biography of the mover and shaker of Northern California wrestling for its glory period, big time wrestling, Roy Shire called The Professor, the rest pro wrestling genius of Roy Shire. And Brian, do you know how to sell? The, I don't know how to sell these books because he's in the situation I'm in. As soon as he releases something, it escapes and it's sold out. And I've, I've every time he, by the time that I get the book and read it or even begin to read it, he's already tweeting that these the the printing is sold out. He's gone through multiple printings of of each of his California history books, but but it, I've started it, and so far it's tremendous. And this is another one of those guys. We're finding that all of the all the people from my generation that I the promoters and bookers that I worked for, and some of the top wrestlers of that time. We're we're narrowing these things down because you know it, it the influence of just a few people spread to uh, almost everybody in modern wrestling. So we're getting down to the nub that in the in the fifties and forties, guys like Dory Funk Senior and Roy Shire and Buddy Fuller, for that matter, on the other end of the the country down there in the southeast, uh, uh just a handful of these guys and Buddy Rogers shaped and invented the the way that modern pro wrestling was done finishes and gimmicks and television and return matches and stipulations and it all comes from a very small group roy shire was was in on that 
Very fascinating. Have you started the book yet? Not yet. And I really want to. And I also know what his next project's going to be. And he's just doing an amazing job. Rock Rims of not just documenting all of California, but specifically Northern California history, the overall territory. And before it was a territory. And now, of course, Roy Shire. And I believe Ray Stevens is his next project. Yeah. And I said it before, he's got to have had a time machine. His research is incredible, but he takes you right there. He takes you right into it. And so it's amazing. But anyway, we don't really know how to plug these books uh, because they sell out instantly. Rock needs to start printing more. Um, but we will uh, we will keep uh, keep people apprised on these projects and if he does go through another printing. And also, and I'm going to tease this, this is way in the future, but I've got an advanced look all I'll say is that I guess it's going to be next year before this thing's out, but the book of the year for pro wrestling is already fucking dusted up for 2020 and, or 2022 and possibly for years after this. There is a book in the works about one of the biggest names in the history of the wrestling industry. Not any era, not the pioneer era or the modern era, or the tip, just any era in the history of wrestling. One of the biggest names. I learned more about this individual from this book than I've ever learned in one place that I didn't know about any figure in pro wrestling since I was like 12 years old. It's fucking amazing. And I can't wait to talk about it. And you know who you are, person who sent me this book to review. So, uh, thumbs up. Anyway, we have a correction. At least I've been told we have a correction. I've not seen any evidence, pro or con, yay or nay, of what happened. We just read a question on the drive through the other day, and now we've been taken to task by a number of people. The question was basically, what do you think about the Miz playing in a charity softball game when he's supposed to be hurt and injured on TV. And of course we didn't think much of that because that would be stupid. Now we are hearing, and I still don't know because I haven't seen this game, nor have I had a chance to watch this game, nor do I really, would I ever care to watch this game. Uh, but now he didn't play. He was just on the sidelines as a coach and he was, had a, gimmick on his knee or his leg or he was selling in some description which is the truth here brian do we owe someone an apology do we owe the questioner on the drive through a uh a tongue lashing for misinformation and malfeasance what's going on here i don't know exactly because i'm a baseball fan and i like all-star weekend i used to until they fucked up the uniforms home run derby's a lot of fun though but no one gives a shit about the celebrity softball game where they just take a variety of numbskulls and put them on a field with legends of baseball and have them run around like idiots like they know how to fucking play a sport. It's stupid, so no one watches it. I don't watch it. It's on after the Home Run Derby. The Home Run Derby. What is the fucking Home Run Derby? It's the main Do they event. have a bunch of horses running around the goddamn bases? It's a one-night home run tournament where you go one-on-one -on -one against another competitor. Whoever gets the most home runs in that round goes on to the next one. At the end of the night, the winner is the champion. Well, gets... well wait, well, where do the horses come in? There are no horses. Well, wait, why do they call it a derby? If I... they're going to rip <laughs> off the Kentucky Derby and, and not even give anybody any horses? Hey, hold on. Can I ask you? I don't think I've asked you on air. I got to ask you. How big was the story locally about the Kentucky Derby uh, winner, the cheating? Oh, if I'd have par cared or paid attention, it was very big. Yes, very big. I just, I just, I've only watched the weather for the last several months just to keep the Monroes from being struck by lightning. But, but anyway, what I'm saying is, if there's no horses in the Derby, well, that's misrepresentation right there. But so it's just a bunch of people trying to hit home runs. What, well, what if, what if none of them hit a home run? Well, by the way, this year's champion, repeating his champion two years in a row from the New York Mets, Pete Alonso. Let's go, Mets. Fuck the rest of baseball, but that's what the main if nobody event. Nobody gets the home run. I mean, it's not no, just. No, there's a lot of home runs. If you ever look at baseball history, whenever we get to a point where someone's not hitting home runs, Major League Baseball juices the balls and everyone hits home runs. So we don't have to worry about that. 
But so, but they're just out there, just basically hitting one home run after another to see who gets the most home runs. Correct. It's well, very that seems exciting. Boring. It's very exciting. Oh, it's very exciting. But it also goes on for a while. So the celebrity yeah, softball, imagine. the celebrity softball game that was taped a day earlier, airs after that at what ten ten thirty p.m. on ESPN. No one's watching it. No one cares. With that said. What does this have to do with the price? Because I didn't Andrew watch it. China. I didn't see the fucking Miz. And then I remember the email because the person called him the Miss. And <laughs> I saw one photo of him standing up high-fiving someone. That's all I know. I read the question. No, so but here's the thing. Did- no one gives a shit about the Miz or the softball game or the Miz being in the softball game. With the exception of this person who... Ask the question. So what So what you're doing is you are disavowing any knowledge of the activities, Mr. Phelps, of the activities of the Miz, and, and, and you're basically saying that we don't owe a correction or a retraction or anything because of the fact that nobody gives a shit about the Miz anyway is what you're saying. I disavow. Well, if if we did malign Frogface for doing something that he didn't do, then we since there's so many other things that he did do to malign him for, we apologize for that one. Was there any outcry? I didn't hear anyone say anything one way or the other about this. Did you really get feedback? No, about six or seven people on Twitter. Hey, no, he wasn't playing, or however many. I don't know. It wasn't. It wasn't a wasn't an angry mob. Carrying it wasn't forces. him. <laughs> I don't know. Well, maybe they mistook some other child-sized, you know, reality TV wannabe for uh, him. Anyway, did you hear about, I say, did you hear about, I sounded good there. I'm, I'm in good voice today. Did you hear about the big debut, Brian, the big, the new promotion that's going to take over the world? The incredible debut event that they had that made the news. It actually did make the news. Did you hear about this? This huge new promotion that's going to take the world by storm? I have no idea what you're talking about. At Sushi Onitas. FM, what is it? FMWE Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling Explosion. His new exploding ring promotion made its debut. You didn't hear about this? You didn't read about this? I heard nothing about this. Okay, well, for the folks at home, we will recap. Since the Booker of the Year, Tony Khan, and the Balding Plumber and Twinkle Toes decided to have the exploding ring match, which, of course, Onita was known for in the 90s when he did the stadium shows and Funk and Foley and all the whole merry band of characters that he had had at that time. And they do the exploding, and they didn't just do garbage wrestling, you know, deathmatch stuff. They did exploding deathmatch stuff. So, of course, Onita, who I think you will acquiesce to this, concur with this, that Onita is probably one of the more egotistical some bitches in the world because he has been about getting and done a very good job of it, getting himself over for the last 30 years. But I mean, remember when he. He would he would go to any lane. He almost killed himself a number of times to make news or to get over or to be back in the limelight. Remember when he jumped off the bridge into the river in front of all the fans that had just seen him do his big death match barbed wire thing and he was cut up and bleeding so much he jumped in the polluted river and got blood infections and hospitalized and almost killed him? Remember that one? Remember when he brought over Jose Gonzalez and did an angle at a press conference where he got yes. stabbed? Yes, he had a, the guy who stabbed and killed and murdered Bruiser Brody for real. He flew him over to Japan and had an did an angle with him where he got stabbed at a press conference. And the people, even even the garbage wrestling fans, that was over the line for them. A bridge too far, a stabbing too far, and they never actually brought Gonzalez back to have the match, did they? No, that they was had to it. Cancel the whole thing. I believe so. So anyway, so since they did the exploding ring match at AEW, and boy, was that, as the old saying goes, a fart in church, a popcorn fart, a a, a fizzle, a, not the sizzle, but the fizzle. 
but everybody was talking about it. Onita decided he was going to relaunch this new promotion in Japan. And I'll have you know, it's called, I swear to God, it's like, because it, his old promotion was FMW. It's like FMW Explosion. And they did their first event, Brian, outdoors in Japan at a fruit and vegetable market. Oh, lovely. let me say that again. An expl an exploding ring match in an outdoor fruit and vegetable market. In front of a massive crowd of 425 people, they had a basically deathmatch card highlighted by the main event, which was a barbed wire blast barricade mat mine explosive bat and tables deathmatch. And basically what happened was by the time they fired off all the shit and did all their stuff, it caused so much smoke that people around this fucking fruit and vegetable market called the fucking fire department and the fire department showed up to see what was going on and the show made the news. I'm going to just tell you right now, because I hadn't heard anything about this, I thought you were either making this all up or... No. or that someone was playing a prank on you, but I looked it up and yeah, no, this is all really happening. He's got, these guys are so fucking, and I mean, Onita's, that's, he makes, probably has made, I don't know what he's been doing lately, but he made a lot of fucking money doing this shit. But the rest of these fucking guys, how much money can you make in front of 425 people at a fruit and vegetable market? To blow yourself up, wrap yourself up in barbed wire, throw yourself through fucking tables while it, and hey, one thing you can always say is they do the explosions right over there. They don't have pesky things like safety codes and health issues and liability to be sued when you blow up members of the general public and all that stuff. So they really, remember they, they incinerated the sheik. Onita in, gave the Sheik hospitalized with third degree burns in 1995. Um, they've set several people on fire back then, so they don't go with these little pussy explosions or sparklers like AEW did. No, they just really set people on fire and blow them up. And in front of 425 people at a fruit and vegetable market. It's a good so, deal. Could work and get some free apples, maybe. Yeah, and boy, and the guacamole is fresh, and 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 the smell of the guacamole is fresh, and the smell of burning flesh. That's their, <laughs> that's their sales pitch. Uh, <laughs> I, I love, I love the smell of burning wrestler in the morning at a good fruit and vegetable market. Hey, let me ask you, what do you remember about Onita when he was in Memphis in '81? What was he like? Was he quiet? He, well, Did he talk to you? I mean, well, no, he was he was he was quiet because he, they they either one him or Fucci either one barely spoke English. Um, no, they were like normal Japanese young boys, very respectful, worked hard. They traveled with Tojo because he's had had experience since the '60s with all the. I mean, I, he was probably driving a Nokia around uh, when they sent him to Tennessee in the '60s. Um, but he, you know, he was responsible for the guys and, and, you know, got them rides to and from everything. And they were very respectful and they worked hard. They were never late, but there was not a, this was when I was still a photographer. I wasn't sitting on the bench next to him in the locker room, but they still didn't talk that much because their command of English was very limited. This was, I, did they did they come, did they go anywhere in this country before they went to Tennessee? I'm think it may have been their first stop. If not, cause they went from here, I think to Florida, maybe they came to the central States for a little while, but they had not been here long. I remember Fucci comes up the stairs one night, teeny Christine Jarrett told us this story afterwards. She said, I was so embarrassed. I felt so bad for him. Fucci comes up. They've gotten there before the doors open. And they've gone in the locker room and they put their bags down. They come back up the stairs. And of course, she's sitting where she usually would sit at the top of the stairs, checking everybody in, make sure they got the license. And he looks at her and he says, Thursday, 
Thursday. And she said, no, this is Tuesday, Tuesday. And he shook his head. He said, no, no, Thursday, Thursday. And she said, no, it's Tuesday. And she said, Tuesday. And then he, he points to his mouth and he says, no, Thursday, Thursday. And then he makes like he's drinking a drink. <laughs> and he was thirsty. He's asking, where's the goddamn water fountain or someplace I can get something to drink, right? She's, oh, I'm sorry. Go over right over there behind the curtain. So, I mean, it wasn't like they were having any deep conversations where they were talking, telling stories about, you know, uh, Japan, but it, and because they had trained, I mean, they could, you could call spots with them and they get spots for the time is what I'm trying to say. Cause nobody was doing 14 phase high spots. It was ridiculous. You know, drop down, hip toss, body slam, drop kick. You come back. No, you stop me. Whatever. That's. That's the first English that those guys would learn because that's the first that they would need is being able to either call matches and or have matches called for them, you know, in the ring. But, but no, they were normal. <laughs> and that th it, everybody thinks that, um, that, uh, you know, Onita, the concession stand match. Well, yeah, yeah. The, everybody thinks that, that, Onita, you know, invented this shit or whatever the fuck based on, he invented it based on the concession stand match, not the style of matches that they were having in Tennessee. It was just the one angle that they did. They they had, Onita and Fuji, they were a good team and they were very athletic, but they had normal wrestling matches, backdrops and body slams and drop kicks and spots and you know, and et cetera, it just, they did that angle with Eddie Gilbert and Ricky Morton in Tupelo to try to juice up their rivalry. And of course, as we've mentioned, diminishing returns, because that was actually the third Tupelo concession stand brawl. The first one tripled the business and territory. The second one with Wayne Ferris, Larry Latham and Ricky and Robert Gibson heated up their program underneath, but it wasn't a main event deal. And then the third one with Fuchi and Onita and Gilbert and Morton was the the bloodiest and wildest and best, really most realistic looking probably brawl because they really beat the shit out of each other, but it drew absolutely no money because it was two underneath tag teams and, and people had seen it. So, but otherwise they had normal matches, you know, nor normal for the time. There wasn't any, they didn't have barbed wire matches or these ridiculous hardcore stipulation matches they just did an angle in tupelo where they got out of hand and from that onita makes a whole goddamn style of wrestling out of it because he he destroyed his knees and he couldn't what was he out for two or three years he couldn't work at all and then he came back and modified his style because he could do this shit without you know having to have you know all of his faculties yeah he was one of their like young junior heavyweights in all japan yeah and then and he came he was, back in 89 and all of a sudden he's the wild thing. Well, wait, he was doing, he was their young junior heavyweight prospect that was going to be on the top of that division. And he was doing all kinds of dives out of the ring and all kinds of acrobatics and all kinds of wild moves. And wouldn't you know what happened? He tore his knees up and he couldn't work anymore. So then he has to come up with a style that he can work without being actually able to work. And guess what? Garbage wrestling. It's amazing how this works out. Uh, and speaking of injuries, oh, God damn it. We get no Walter and Elia too. Have you heard about this? I heard that the match wasn't going to happen because there was an injury. And immediately my thought was, are they waiting until they could have fans there? Is this an angle? No, no. I have I've read uh, several places, including PW Insider, where what that I trust that it's not an angle. He hurt his hand. What Walter did some kind of way, smacking yeah. someone. <laughs> that's well, yeah, I mean, that's like that's like an old joke you'd ask Bill Dundee after he punched you. Did you hurt your fucking hand? Um. But no, apparently this is a legitimate injury. And I, I, 
I had a, I saw an article that referred to something and I couldn't find the original thing, but it was like he was doing some kind of angle or some kind of bit of business somewhere and suffered a hand injury. And now they've postponed the match and it's been termed a serious hand injury. Maybe they're playing up the severity of the, the nature of it or whatever. I hope so. Because God, that's what was it a week or two ago? We said, okay, that is the one match. We are not going to miss. I'm absolutely looking forward to that. That's the best match I've seen in the last five fucking years. The last one they had. I guess we'll have to wait that long again. Have you had any any chance to Google this and find out any more about it, or are you just sitting there like a bump on a log, as, as Mama Cornette used to say? You know, it's a thin line between a <laughs> bump on a log and Googling the Walter injury. I, uh... You know, I haven't I'm seen a anything. The tide of wire. I have one side <laughs> and the other's fire. Okay. <clears throat> what? I was going to say, I haven't seen anything that expands upon what you said already. So I've pretty much summarized the issue here. It's like we're doing in the news. You are the Walter Cronkite of this yeah. program. I'm the John Solomon Quasi of. Uh... <laughs> Actually, that would even be funnier if people remembered John Cameron Swayze. Um, okay, and another injury. Bailey. I know you've heard about this. I did hear about this. I believe she was injured. I don't know if it was mandatory, but there was company training before they go back out on the road. And she got hurt. Tore Was it she tore her ACL? Yes, yes. And she's going to be out nine months, so that puts into question next year's WrestleMania after she got jacked around on this year's WrestleMania. I feel so bad for this girl. Cause she's a fucking, she's, she's an all around team player. She can work. She can heal. She can talk. You can tell she's got her shit together and they make her train. She's the last person that needed to be training. God damn it. Developmental is one thing. But when somebody reaches the point where they they know what they're doing to the level that she does, I could understand if she'd been off with an injury for a, a, some number of months or for some reason had not been in the ring, but she's been wrestling. It's only once or a week or whatever it is for television, but goddamn. You it, the the old saying of the boys: you've only got so many bumps on your bump card. Once you know how to take the flat back bump, except for just keeping up your timing, like I said, coming back from some long layoff and getting in the ring and fiddle fucking around. Why do they have people that have been in the mix and been on television and can obviously stay in shape in the gym? They've got plenty of time to do that. Why are they at the, Bailey's the last one? Why don't they bring the AEW roster in and train them? They need mandatory training. Bailey didn't need to be training. I, I, now they have training sessions before they go out on the road. So take some bumps before you go out and take bumps. That's one of those things about the performance center. I always wondered. You know, I mean, you want everyone to be healthy. You want everyone to be in shape. And I really wondered how beneficial it was to have this one facility where everyone is not only training, but being monitored while they train. And you have to look a certain way, you know, to make WWE happy. And I don't know. I just think that has nothing to do with what skills you really need to get over, you know, and, and actually have people care about you. So, I mean, it's just, I think they focus too much on this shit. It's too much on. What the guy's arms look like and how much he can lift. Who gives a shit? Like, just let them be wrestlers. Well, but and, 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 again, I understand training, d developmental training. Obviously, we operated OVW. Um, you, there is a need to replicate the experience, not only the experience, but the repetition that guys used to get by just getting a job where they were in the preliminaries working, jerking the curtain every night, but working in a territory where they were working six days a week and if not more, and, you know, 25 times a month, if not more TV, you know, a couple matches the same day. That was, that was how you 
got your shit together. And that was how you trained. You were training in front of people. It's just if you had to be good enough to be in front of people to begin with to get that opening match spot. But then you got your training in front of people, in front of crowds and repetition night after night in front of guys that were in front of guys in the ring with guys that were better than you, more experienced than you, whatever. And that was your training because there were no developmental programs. There were very few, if any, wrestling training programs, except if Ganya would have his camp or Eddie Graham might break some people in or individual guys, whatever. Well, now there aren't that many shows or that many places or that many people to run shows that you would want guys to be on that were under contract to you to learn. So instead, we had to come up with developmental. But in OVW, yes, there were regular wrestling classes, uh, but especially, you know, a guy like Rip Rogers running those, he's not going to have guys taking bump after bump after bump for no reason. Um, or Les Thatcher's not going to have people taking bump after bump after bump. That was a big, I would say, gripe, bitch, complain about Bill DeMott and Andor, uh, the power plant in WCW in the 90s where, you know, with, uh, what is it, Sergeant Parker, where th they would just have guys taking bumps and bumps and bumps. You know, OBW's classes were a few days a week, but the guys also were working in front of people every Wednesday night at television, every Friday and Saturday night spot shows. Sometimes we, we had the Tuesday night church gym downtown as a practice show or the flea market on Sunday once a month. And uh, again, I didn't encourage guys to at the flea market in front of a hundred people to go out there and goddamn, you know, try to have the main event at fucking WrestleMania. I would, it was eight or 10 minutes for them to go out and entertain those people and work on their timing and work on their matches and practice some shit and don't get hurt. Cause they, we were giving them clear parameters about this is a show that you're not going to get hurt on. You, this is for experience. It ain't the Louisville gardens. Then you take a chance. It ain't six flags for television. WWF office going to see it. Then take a few chances, but the, the, the talent knew what kind of shows they were on and, and where they could just make the people happy and where they needed to, you know, to try to expand their repertoires. I, I, I don't understand sending talent in this case, a girl, but any of the talent out there that have still been keeping in shape in the gym and still have access to practice rings at TV and still have been working at least once a week. And now they're going to go out on a house show tour and you want them to go and fucking take bumps and etc. before that. I don't, you know, I don't know. But anyway, I hopefully she'll come back quicker because, uh, it, it, she got, why did they just from a top star, they just jacked her around to an annoy, annoying peripheral character on this year's WrestleMania. Remember, she was just trying to go around and insert herself in between Titus O'Neil and Hulk Hogan, who had such wonderful charisma. They should have been <laughs> together. They should have been the next Laurel and Hardy. Um, anyway, you know what the thing about Bailey and Valter and, and all the rest of these guys and girls is Brian is that they would feel better and probably perform better. Not if they overwork themselves, but instead, if they get a good night's sleep, that's don't right. you agree completely, completely. And folks, I can tell you how you can get the best sleep of your life. I've been talking about how much I've been enjoying my sleep over the last year and a half, not only because of my schedule for once that I'm able to sleep in my own bed at regular hours without being uh, deprived of sleep for days at a time on road trips, etc., or the, at the mercy of these hotel beds that feel like a sack of dirty golf balls. Folks, the Helix sleep mattresses are like floating in a cloud. It's even better than Timothy Leary's acid. I'm telling you, it's like floating in a cloud. And you don't even have to lick these or swallow them. You can just order them on the internet and they will be delivered to your door. Folks, the Helix Sleep mattress 
is matched to your body type and sleep preferences to find the perfect mattress for you. You just go to Helix, H-E-L-I-X, helixsleep.com, and you take a quiz. It takes about two minutes, and basically you tell them how you like to sleep, on your side, on your back, on your stomach, whether you like soft, medium, or firm. They have mattresses that are great for cooling you down if you sleep hot, a mattress for plus-size people. Uh, you just give them the answers to these uh, simple questions, and they match you up with the product that most closely resembles what you want in a mattress. And then, since you're at helixsleep.com, if you slash JCE, use that JCE, they're offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for just our listeners, because they love us and we love them. It's got a 10-year warranty. You get tried out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you will love it. And it comes delivered to your door in a compact box that you can take to the location you want this giant mattress, and you can easily unbox it and set it there, and then boom, and it go poof, it comes to life, and it's amazing. It's actually mind-blowing, which goes back to that Timothy Leary stuff I was talking about. Don't take LSD, folks. Sleep on a Helix Sleep mattress. HelixSleep.com slash JCE. Up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. HelixSleep.com slash JCE. Sleep in a cloud. Well, Jim, I could say I, for one, can't wait to get back on my Helix mattress after this and go take a nap yeah it's because you got your back is bad you're you're down in your back you don't want to admit it to the people but you are and and i think it's because of that that squeaky chair you sit in i did indeed throw out my back the chair wasn't the reason you should have thrown out the chair instead of your back i think that's coming next now it was very much a a dynamite kid hamilton ontario kind of incident I was just casually running the ropes of life, like I always do, nonchalantly, and something happened. I'm not exactly sure quite what, and my back hurts. Well, that's because of all those big, crazy bumps you've been taking off ladders in previous times in your life. Anyway, I have tidbits. Are you ready for the historical tidbit section? We've been talking about some of these, and they've been very popular. and. Uh, they, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we plugged uh, Rock Rims earlier. We'll plug Scott Teal again and CrowbarPress.com, who has reissued, or not reissued, but issued a compilation of classic St. Louis wrestling programs from 1943 through 1951. And when we talked about those, that made me go back to my volumes, the famous St. Louis Wrestling Club office set that I have in my possession and go through some more in the following year because 1951, 52, 53 was right during the middle of the network television boom and wrestling was, was quite hot in most parts of the country. St. Louis, as we've talked about, had been majorly successful all through the World War II years and the rest of the 40s, something that some of the cities in the country couldn't say, but now TV has blown up and it's settled in. And we've mentioned before the guys uh, that were the big stars of the Dumont Network show out of Chicago, which was the big one. They're, you know, the highest paid professional athletes in the country, but the world heavyweight boxing champion made in those days more money than pretty much any professional athlete in the United States. and the next four spots were pretty much all taken by professional wrestlers in those days. You're a baseball fan. What what kind of money was a pro baseball player making in 1952? Ooh, off the top of my head, I don't have an answer. $100,000 would probably be the very tops. But well, was- I, I think you ought to look that up because I think you'll be surprised. Because I don't think it's that much. And I, and I know we've heard the stories about the NFL salaries in the 50s and 60s, as a matter of fact, which is why that so many guys, they weren't the the absolute star players in the NFL, but they were definitely uh, top players, you know, Wahoo McDaniel, Ernie Ladd, uh, you know, guys like that, 
started wrestling in the off seasons and then decided to do it full time because the pay in the National Football League in those days was negligible compared to not only to what it is now, but even to what top wrestlers were making. What year did you say? 1952. 52. Okay, it went down. It's interesting. Just to give you a little bit of a, just to show you a little bit of where it was, 1948, the top baseball salary was 65000 there for you go. both Joe DiMaggio and Ted Williams. In 49, Joe DiMaggio got 100000 100000 again in 1950, and then a pay cut. 90000 in 1951, 1952, Ted Williams is the most, is paid the most amongst baseball players, $85,000. Okay, now look up football in your little Google machine there. Because the NFL players were making much less, and those were the biggest stars in baseball at that time, right? That was the biggest. Oh, Ted Williams and Joe DiMaggio? Yeah, they were. I mean, Joe DiMaggio's finishing out his career, but those were the two biggest stars of that generation. Your average average schlub second baseman on the, you know, bottom half teams was probably at 15 grand, maybe, maybe. And the football salaries were not there yet. The reason why that the wrestlers were paid so well in comparison is because the wrestling payoff philosophy had had actually uh, devolved from the way it was in the 30s when, when guys like Strangler Lewis or Jim Londos would get major chunks of, of the gate on the events in order to wrestle because they were the clear draws and, you know, nobody else was in their league. It actually devolved that guys in the fifties were getting less as a percentage of the gate, but because of the amount of shows being run and the amount of work that they could get and the amount of matches they could be booked in. And the fact that you know, wrestling uh, was still back in those days and still in the 80s, almost always run on a shoestring. <clears throat> you could make more money as a pro wrestler than you, at a top pro wrestler, than you could at almost any other professional sport in the world. Uh, did you find anything on football yet before we go into some of this? No, it's not as easy to find as baseball because baseball has people who put up a lot more information yeah well also because you you know a lot more baseball sites i'm sure but i mean you you'll any any football fans out there that have read some of the biographies of the guys from the 50s and 60s you know we're talking major names that you would think were taken care of that weren't making 20 grand so anyway um we had been talking about the st louis attendance but i've got some figures not only for st louis but also a few things in chicago some uh, ephemera about the uh, the ticket prices and also a little bit about the NWA champion. And I'd asked the question when we did this a, a show or two ago. I said, well, hey, I said, what, uh, how many tickets did the WWE sell in their entire company, company-wide, in 2019 before the pandemic how many live event tickets and i had two people answer me with two different answers but they were close one said 1.2 million and one said 1.4 million and that that sounds about right with what you've heard in with stockholders reports and these uh conference calls and etc i would think that's a that's certainly in the ballpark right probably does that count saudi arabia because that's a different animal altogether well, I don't know. I don't know whether that would count Saudi Arabia or not, because they were special shows. But anyway, okay, so what were they getting for in Saudi Arabia? Sixty, seventy thousand in yeah, the stadium? I mean, it was a stadium, so I think it would probably be Okay, that, yeah. well okay, well then then let's how many shows they have in Saudi Arabia in twenty nineteen? I have to look that up. Well, let's let's go ahead and give them instead of one point two to one point four, let's give them one point five million. There's two or three stadium shows, and that sounds great until you realize that they're by far the biggest promotion in the country in the world, and nothing else in this country comes close in terms of their reach, and that's one and a half million tickets 
for the entire year. Now, we know in 1974, we've talked about Memphis selling almost 400,000 tickets just in the Mid-South Coliseum. But in St. Louis in 1951, and remember, Brian, they started seasonal wrestling in, what was it, the late 40s, early 50s in St. Louis, where they would not run May, June, July, and August, and maybe even September. They'd run everything from October through April. And those were the days when they were running. Those shows would be every week. They would alternate between Tom Pax and Sam Muchnick's outfit. But anyway. Sam wanted to watch the Cardinals, so they should. <laughs> there, there you go. Down. And that's why these programs are so valuable, because as we've mentioned, you know, with Muchnick being a former journalist and a sports writer and them trying to make wrestling as sports-like and legitimate as possible. They have these quotes from newspaper articles. We quoted something from the Wall Street Journal that they had uh, uh, on one of these segments before. They also have athletic commission gates and attendance figures and legitimate ticket prices. They try to make it like, you know, like the, the other ring sport besides boxing, where they're really playing it straight. So you get facts and figures that, uh, you know, you wouldn't have gotten in some of the other territories because they didn't give a fuck and they just, you know, hey, <laughs> Bob Luce's program, blood, death, fear. But anyway, in 1951, for seven months in St. Louis, there were no shows May through September, but for 26 events in the other months of 1951, They'd sold 200,000 tickets. The average attendance was 8,000 per event. And the St. Louis ticket prices for the, uh, uh, for the house shows were $3 down to 75 cents. And they had five different levels because the Keele Auditorium was a massive old place and some seats in some locations were better than others. So they had five different price levels, but it was three dollars, two twenty-five, one fifty, a dollar, and general admission was seventy-five cents. And in 1951-52-53, with the inflation calculator that we like to use, you can times everything by about ten because it it equals about ten dollars and sixty something cents uh, in today's money. So that was basically. $32 down to a little a little under a dollar or a little under $10 for their ticket prices, which wasn't bad compared to what they are these days. The Chicago International Amphitheater. Just if anybody wanted to know, that's where the big stuff was taking place in Chicago on the Dumont Network at that time. They were more expensive. The ticket prices there at the International Amphitheater, Brian, three dollars and ninety cents ringside, all the way down to a dollar thirty general admission, and they had a capacity of twelve thousand fans. That would be what somewhere around uh, forty, forty, forty-one, forty-two dollars down to about fourteen. The Marigold Gardens, however, which also did TV tapings for the Dumont network had 1800 seats and the prices were 250 down to a dollar 25. Fascinating, eh? You know, I mean this goes into something you brought up before, but I have a big collection of wrestling as you like it and wrestling life. But especially the early years, it's amazing how much was happening in Chicago. Yeah, at one time, multiple shows a week, stars everywhere, two different promotions. TV everywhere. Uh, yeah, we've talked about, you know, up to four and five live events per week in Chicagoland, in the metropolitan Chicago area, where there was Marigold Gardens, there was Rainbow Arena, the International Amphitheater. Uh, they also went out to, you know, as far as Hammond and Gary, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, some information on the Ganya thez rivalry. People will remember that Luthez was the NWA champion. Vern Gagne had been an NCAA wrestling champion in the United States. Same thing that Kurt Angle did, same thing that Brock Lesnar did. But Vern Gagne had done that in the late 40s. And when he turned pro, it was with a huge push, and he was made the United States champion out of, the, out of Chicago by Fred Kohler off the Dumont Network. And he was starting to rival 
the NWA champion in terms of drawing power and popularity uh, because of that strong TV and, and Kohler was trying to, and, and did succeed for some time in sending Ganya out as the U S champion with the same deal that the NWA world champion did the, the NWA champion in those days got 10% of the gate after taxes of the, uh, of the event that he was on and Ganya was getting, that's how, where Ganya made the money to go back to Minneapolis a few years later and buy into the territory. Uh, Ganya was probably besides Thez, the highest paid wrestler in the business for a couple of years there. And the heat, over Ganya and Kohler really trying to supplant the NWA champion as the number one touring guy and get the same money is why that the NWA never put the title on Ganya and he finally ended up making his own in the AWA because he was he was at that level at that point. So just for example, it, it should have been Ganya instead of Hutton. Yes. Because And Ganya, Thez was insistent that it was going to be Hutton. Ganya was as every much as legitimate a wrestler as Dick Hutton because Dick Hutton was an NCAA champion and he was an amateur great, but he didn't draw any money as a professional. He was boring and he didn't have it, whereas Ganya had been huge and had the wrestling credentials, but they tried to do the NWA's gimmick and they didn't appreciate it, which is is and and that was and Ganya made it for the people in Minnesota and people in his home area, when he went there and started the AWA, he made it legitimate by saying, everybody knows that I haven't had an NWA title match in the past three years. The champion has ducked me. I'm issuing this challenge. You know, if he does not meet me at such and such time, you know, it, it made it real. And it was like, he was the, the victim, the put upon guy that couldn't get a chance because the champion was scared of him. So that's what made him in his territory. It worked out for all parties because Vern and Wally Carbo having the AWA, which was geographically a pretty significant size territory. Yeah. Helped the NWA with their antitrust issues. Yeah, that's true because they could say, well, look, they're, they're all over. They're as big as we are, but the, the, the AWA got the Dakotas, right? <laughs> so that, that's seven people in two states. Anyway, but during the time where Ganya was first getting hot as the U.S. champion, Thez was the NWA champion, they did meet in Chicago in 1952. I believe that's the match that's on YouTube and drew a $26,000 house, which was a sellout at the International Amphitheater, but $26,000 in 2021 is $266,000. That's a gate at the International Amphitheater in a town that was has, running four live events a fucking week in its metropolitan area. That was just the big show at the amphitheater. For when, when they were, they were, were they weekly back then or was it every two weeks still? I have to go back and check. I thought it was weekly, but I have to go back and check. At the International yeah. Amphitheater, it may have been yes. two weeks. I think it weeks. was every two weeks, but they were, yeah, they were all over the place anyway. Here's just a little run uh, in 1952 for you. Uh, as I mentioned, St. Louis was running every week. One week would be a Muchnik show. One week would be a Tom Pax slash uh, Martin Thez promotion show. And these are not all of the events. I just, I got a few attendance figures. On January 11th, Luthez versus the Mighty Atlas drew 10,933. On February 22nd, Thez versus Bobby Manigoff, 10,295. March 7th, 1952, Ganya versus Ray Eckert, 10,928. March 21, 1952, Thez versus Manigoff again, 10,213. March 28th, Thez versus Ganya in St. Louis, uh, 11,663 people. That was a sellout at the Keel Auditorium, paid $19,210. That would be the equivalent of right at two hundred grand today. And that was at the end of the month when they had run three shows beforehand, drawing over 10,000 people. Um, and here was an interesting statistic. Vern Ganya, according to this report, was set to make 
over $70,000 in 1952, which would be equivalent to $717,687 in 2021. And that would where did that put him? Right at Ted Williams, or was it uh, was it the other fella you talked about? It put him right at Lake Minnetonka. <laughs> no, yeah. it put him. Uh, it put him right at I believe it was Ted Williams for fifty two. Yeah. Okay. So yes, and that's when Ganya was still on the way up. Um. This is a nice statistic for nineteen fifty two. This is for St. Louis in 29 shows from January through April and September through December, because as I mentioned, they had a season. They sold 208,952 tickets for $268,000 at the gate. 29 shows, 208,000 fans. That's about what? 9,000 or 8,000 average. But that 268,000 at the gate translates to $2,750,000 in today's money in one city in a eight-month period. Uh, It also mentions that in 1951, Luthez defended his title 55 times. Now, that does not say that's all he wrestled. uh, That was the NWA title defenses. And when we remember 1951 was before a lot of the territories formed and were running seven nights a week and there were no interstates and Thez didn't like to work tank towns and he had the power at that point. So I would imagine that he probably wrestled less than a hundred times overall counting TV tapings, non-title matches, what whatsoever. And he was claiming that he earned right out a hundred thousand dollars which would be $1,025,000 in today's money. And honestly, that's not a ridiculous estimate when you consider that he got 10%. And 1951 was not as big as 52. We're going to talk about that in a second. But uh, it was still, they drew major gates in Chicago and in St. Louis and in Houston and all the places, the big places the NWA champion would work. And that, uh, you know, Strangler Lewis, 25 years before that, was getting bigger payoffs per show, but there weren't as many shows. But now, because there's all these shows running, the NWA champion is still is pretty much the highest paid guy in wrestling, and as we've seen, one of the highest paid guy in pro sports, but he didn't have to wrestle uh, 300 plus days a year like the NWA champion did in the seventies. So you see the pattern is wrestlers started out in the thirties making a fucking fortune. And then they were still making a lot of money. The top ones in the fifties, but they had to work more for it. And then by the seventies and eighties, they were making more money, but they had to work three times as much. Are you catching this pattern, Brian? Yeah. And you know, I just pulled up uh, one of my random issues here of wrestling as you like it. July 14th, 1951, Elephant Boy and Slave Girl on the cover. So this is just one week, because this came out every week. Yeah. So this is one week in Chicago. On July 14th at the Marigold Arena, Rudy K versus Chief Lone Eagle, two out of three falls. George Doucette versus Zach Malkov. And Ombre Montana and Roman Cernatas versus Bob Clay and Gene Bowman. Two out of three falls. George Craig versus Ned Taylor. That's the 14th. On the 16th, once again at the Marigold Arena, George Doucette versus Leon Kirilenko. Two out of three falls. Ombre Montana and Ramon Cernatas once again against Al Williams and Bozo Brown. Bozo Brown, wow. Bozo Brown, Frank Spaceman Hickey. Yeah, two out of three falls. Lee Savaldi versus Carl Engstrom. And Bob Geigel in the opening match versus Zach Malkov. So that's July 14th and 16th, both at the Marigold. And then there's an ad here also for, let me turn the page, Friday, July 13th. So in between those shows, or no, right before that. Right before. First show. Lake County Stadium, Round Lake Park, Illinois, where there's wrestling every Friday night. Vern Gagne versus Lone Eagle in the main event the NWA Junior Heavyweight Champion versus the Indian Star. 
plus Rudy K and Al Williams versus Ombre Montana and Raymond Cernadas and George Doucette versus Bozo Brown. And then here, listen to this. Here's wrestling on TV in 51. On Saturday, it's on at 8.30, wrestling from the Marigold Arena. Doesn't look like it's on Sunday. On Monday, it's on at 11 o'clock, wrestling with Russ Davis. On Tuesday, it's on at 11 o'clock, wrestling with Russ Davis. On Wednesday, it's on at 8.30, wrestling with Wayne Griffin, followed by, at 9 o'clock, international boxing and wrestling, followed by wrestling with Russ Davis at 11. On Thursday, you have wrestling at 10 p.m., wrestling at 11 p.m. with Russ Davis, and on Friday, once again at 11, wrestling with Russ Davis. That's all in one week in Chicago. And there was no International Amphitheater show that week. And actually, hold on, I have a note here. Glad you brought that up. I just saw this when I was flipping through here. Kohler to feature major mat cards. Promoter Fred Kohler plans on featuring several major wrestling shows in the International Amphitheater in the fall. Dates are now being sought by the promoter at the arena. Well, and speaking of which, if we, that what what year was that? Was that 51 or 52? 51. It was July 14, 51. Okay, well in 1952, just so we know, uh one of those uh or two of those international amphitheater events, uh Fez versus Ganya on January 25th, 1952, drew $25,712 and in Chicago, actually this was outdoors. June 20th in Chicago, Thez versus Pat O'Connor drew $35,717 because there was a piece on Thez's box office power. And in seven matches in 1952, and I know you're going to know one of them, Lou Thez versus various opponents grossed $323,347 dollars at the gate which in 2021 would be three million three hundred fifteen thousand one hundred seventy three dollars in chicago january 25th thez ganya twenty five thousand seven hundred and twelve march 1st in milwaukee thez versus killer kowalski twenty six thousand seven eighteen in st louis april 11th thez versus ganya twenty two thousand six seventeen june 20th chicago thez o'connor thirty five thousand seven hundred and seventeen July 5th, Los Angeles. You know this one versus Baron Leone. That's right. The all-time gate record to that point in time for pro wrestling, $103,517, and that was 25,400 people, according to the report. I've heard 23,000, but a contemporaneous uh, report said 25. Anyway, uh, November 12th, Los Angeles. Again, Thez indoors, Thez versus Raka, $51,670, which that alone is over half a million today. And November 18th in Madison Square Garden, Thez versus Mr. America, Gene Stanley, $57,396. So in seven matches in 1952, Lou Thez was main evented almost $3.5 million in today's money of, of gate receipts, but he would have made at his 10%, roughly 30 grand on those seven matches. And just to speak to how much he got around, obviously this probably wouldn't be a big gate, but I have here the program, August 31st, 1952, Civic Auditorium, Honolulu, Hawaii's first world championship wrestling match with Lou Thez. So he got over to Hawaii in 52 also. And, well, as a matter of fact, uh, if you want to know a little bit about what the NWA World Champion schedule was like in, uh, in ni- I believe this was the end of 1951. I, I was getting sleepy, and I didn't write it down specifically. But uh, this is not to say this is all of the matches that he had, but these are the high points, and I would think this is probably, like I said, in the days before the interstate and Thez didn't like to work the tank towns, but if you think he wasn't making a fucking fortune. November 12th, the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles. So it's 1952. I'm sorry. November 12th, uh, Los Angeles Olympic Auditorium. November 18th, Madison Square Garden. November 21st, St. Louis at the arena, the big building, not the keel. November 27th, Kansas City. December 2nd, San Francisco. December 7th, Honolulu. 
December 9th, Indianapolis. So Honolulu to Indianapolis before jet planes. December 12th, Chicago. December 17th, Vancouver. December 18th, Seattle. And December 23rd, Minneapolis. So in six weeks, he's gone from literally from one end of the country to the other and back again and out in the Pacific. And you know, those were all major shows. Um, did you know, by the way, when the pile driver and why the pile driver was barred and declared illegal in the state of Missouri, which I believe was the first place to declare it illegal because Longson had just invented it. No, I don't know the story behind that. No. Apparently the reason, uh, uh, the, the time that the pile driver hold was first declared illegal in wrestling was in the state of Missouri by the Missouri athletic commission after the November 22nd, 1942 match between Bill Longson and Strangler Lewis. Strangler Lewis, the aging legend and St. Louis fucking icon, he was injured by the pile driver. They did an injury angle. They brought Longson in in 1941 and started getting heat on him, and then they bring Lewis in, and, and he takes the pile driver and stretchers probably i guess and they declare the pile driver illegal and from then on longson uses it to get heat behind the referees back the way that it happened then in all wrestling behind the referees back injure the baby face get heat cheat whatever and finally after longson's incredible run there in st louis when he starts becoming somewhat of a baby face because he's been there so long and he's been such a top guy by 1952, he was asking the promoters for a championship match against Luthez. They'd traded the belt back and forth over the previous 10 years, but to make the pile driver legal in that match so that he has his best hold to go against Thez. It was all a fucking, they were smart from the beginning. Get, get the hold over, make it so dangerous, take it away, and then let this fucking guy that's a box office bonanza use it to get heat. And in this same program where he's doing this, they mentioned that between 1941 and 1951, Longson had just passed the milestone of selling 1 million tickets in St. Louis alone in a 10-year period to his main event matches. That's long-term booking, fans. And did you know why that St. Louis never had a two out of three fall world championship match until it, until modern times, until way after the 1950s. I don't. Was it an athletic commission thing? Not really. But because uh, this blew me away also when I started reading the fine print, everybody thinks that in the old days, uh, world title matches were always two out of three falls and then they became one fall, right? That's a modern thing. And in most territories, those people that say that would be correct. But in St. Louis, because St. Louis was so entrenched in history and one of the last parts of the country to actually give up the original habits and parameters and rules and etc., St. Louis world title matches were always what they called finish matches. A finish match was their phrase at that time for a match with no time limit. It was a, It's going to go till the finish, right? It's going to go till somebody wins. That's why you would see in the 20s and 30s, the days of Lewis and Stecker and all those guys, matches going four and five hours, right? Because there was no time limit to them. And back in those days, before the big sports arenas, a lot of the money in wrestling was in betting. And so they'd have somebody in the crowd. Well, I bet he's, he's going to beat him in the next 30 minutes. Well, I bet you he won't whatever the fuck they were working right just a different way but st louis kept that tradition of a match for the world championship has to be a finish match therefore they would never book two out of three fall matches on the theory that it would be unbelievable because some matches may go an hour hour and a half two hours remember the old days well we'd be here all night and then finally and as modern times came in they ganya was here in 1953 demanding a two out of three fall match with Lou Thez because he knew that Thez may catch him once, but he couldn't beat him twice in the same night. And the people are shocked because a two out of three fall world title match. Well, that's blasphemy. 
It's fucking, they made everything mean something. Now we got chaos. Anyway, a million tickets, by the way, in one city in a 10-year period, just in your main event matches. How about them apples? Won't see that again. Uh, you know what? It's enough to drive me to distraction and make me need to talk to somebody. But I will not do the normal spot that I do because I have testimony from one of the Cult of Cornet listeners, John, in Murfreesboro. I got this email just, uh, well, when I was able to check my email a few days ago when we got the internet back. And uh, I won't read everything, but just the, the bottom line of it. As someone working in the music business, COVID decimated my industry and my income. And I, like many, turned to alcohol to self-medicate and wound up drinking myself into the hospital more than once in the past year and a half. Realizing that I needed to make a change, I considered therapy, but in the past I've failed because it seemed every therapist wanted to use religion as the cure, whether for depression or alcoholism or whatever, and as an atheist, I simply couldn't work this out. But on a whim, I took your advice to give BetterHelp a try, and I'm happy to say that the therapist BetterHelp matched me with is not only brilliant and wonderfully helpful through the tough times, but he also uses a science-based based approach that doesn't appeal to any invisible men in the sky. Because he was able to talk to me on my level, I finally felt I had the strength of support to become sober, and I'm now at 78 days sober, and I'm exceedingly proud of that accomplishment. And I feel confident in saying that I wouldn't have achieved anything like that if you guys hadn't suggested better help. And that's from John in Murfreesboro, but hopefully it goes for anybody that's taken our advice and and given this a whiz the folks at better help uh are committed to professional counseling done securely online with a broad range of expertise that you can log into your account anytime send messages to your counselor schedule the sessions you know the drill guys you've heard from john take a swing at it go to better help h-e-l-p betterhelp.com slash drive d-r-i-v-e and join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. And you can get 10% off your first month's services when you use that code word, betterhelp.com slash drive. The special offer for the Cult of Cornet, 10% off your first month's services at BetterHelp. Well, you know, Jim, on the topic of better help, I've been trying to help you. I've been recommending videos of chiropractors and different movies that I think would entertain you. And it doesn't seem like you want to help yourself, I have to be honest. Well, no. See, I'm trying to do something for the show here. I'm trying to to uh, get a grip on this modern wrestling. And I figured what I would do, because, you know, we've talked about and we will talk about the problems that the AEW roster has but the WWE is the biggest wrestling promotion in the world right now right they're they're the big dogs so they should have the the widest array and the best quality and the best collection of talent right and i i hate it that all the time we say every time we watch one of the WWE shows we say well there was a good match or two good matches, but God, it's hard to sit two hours or three hours to watch one or two good matches and everything else is kind of boring. So I thought, why don't we go down the roster of the WWE and see if we can separate, as they used to say, the wheat from the chaff to see if we can kind of, because there's some good talent there. We've talked about it. It's, they're just hidden because there's so many. Everybody's a champion. They've got a hundred fucking wrestlers. They've got umpteen programs and it's just watered down and diluted so let's let's do a little a little separating let's put some over on the left hand side and some over on the right hand side and see who we would keep and who we would discard and see if we can get one good quality all-star roster out of the current wwe talent what do you think now you're Doing this based on SmackDown, Raw, and NXT? I'm doing this based on WWE.com because I've got my paper right here because they have a list of superstars, as they call them, that is looks to me like pretty much everybody that ought to be under contract because, God, there's a million of them, and they're all in alphabetical order. So I thought we might go through here and see if we can make some sense out of this. 
Okay. Because if you go to the to the superstars page at WWE.com, at the top they list the champions. Now I'm not I'm not gonna pick amongst these. I'm just gonna tell you who all the champions are right now, and then all the rosters in alphabetical order. But these are just these are the champions in the WWE universe, as they say. Roman Reigns, Universal Champion, Bobby Lashley, WWE Champion, Rhea Ripley, Raw Women's Champion, Bianca Belair, SmackDown Women's Champion, Apollo Crews, Intercontinental Champion, Sheamus, United States Champion, AJ Styles and Omos, almost, Raw Tag Team Champions, Ray and Dominic Mysterio, SmackDown Tag Team Champions, Natalia and Tamina, uh, WWE Women's Tag Team Champions, Akira Tozawa, 24-7 Champion, Karrion Cross, NXT Champion, Ra Raquel Gonzalez, NXT Women's Champion, Isaiah Swerve Scott, NXT North American Champion, I'm running out of goddamn breath, Kushida, NXT Cruiserweight Champion, MSK, M NXT Tag Team Champions, also the worst haircuts in wrestling, and one guy has a bunch of prison tattoos, Io Shirai and Zoe Stark, NXT Women's Tag Team Champions, L.A. Knight is the Million Dollar Champion. Valter is the NXT United Kingdom Champion. Miko Satamura is the NXT UK Women's Champion. Tyler Bate is the NXT UK Heritage Cup Champion. And Pretty Deadly. I don't know who the fuck they are, but they've given Millie Vanilli a run. <laughs> or possibly the Hanson Twins. Remember them? <laughs> Pretty Deadly NXT T UK Tag Team Champions. Those are the champions right now in this company. I think they what? need. I think they need to introduce more belts. It's it, it's fucking ridiculous. There is no way that any even the most devoted fan could keep all this straight. And of course, since they change constantly. And it's watered down and diluted, and every company has multiple belts. And they're all under the, the same auspices. All right. Guess who the first person listed on the actual roster of people without belts is? A kid. Who's a that? dash kid. I'm saying a kid is the first talent. That is his name. A dash kid. A kid <laughs> is the, f and he looks like one from his picture. My God, if you put your mouse. I don't know. Do you have multiple mice hooked up to your computer or just one mouse? Do you have mouse or mice? Well, no, you don't call it mice. I have I have three different, I guess, mice. I have three different mice on my desk <laughs> that are currently in use. You have multiple mice. I have lots of mice. Well, if you put your mouse or your mice over the pictures of these people, they get slightly larger. So when you put your mouse on a kid, he, oh, he looks like he's growing. Anyway, have you ever seen A-Kid? I have not, and according to this, he is from NXT UK. Spanish superstar A-Kid has quickly captured the interest of the WWE Universe, as well as prominent competitors, like the first ever United Kingdom champion, Tyler Bate. How are you reading this? Where are you reading this from? I clicked on his image after it grew. Oh, you click on the picture and it gives you the details. Yeah, and they just ah. go back. Well, I don't care enough. So I don't think we're going to put A-Kid on the list. And the top headline here, July 1st, A-Kid in agony after painful defeat. And it looks like he's being helped by a trainer to the back. Well, all right. Anyway, A-Kid don't make the cut. Adam Cole makes the list. AJ Styles makes the list. Adam Pierce is not a wrestler anymore, but... I'm going to put him over here on the side because there's always something that he could do as far as since he was supposed to be the first color man in Ring of Honor in, in the Sinclair era. And he's a, a fine doing a fine job as an authority figure. We'll put Adam over to the side. Akira Tozawa, the 24-7 champion. I'm willing to let you argue with me for just one second before I move on. Nope. Anything? Nope. nope. Alexa Bliss. We all know that one. Alicia Taylor. Who is Alicia Taylor? The ring announcer in NXT. Okay, okay well, I, I, I'm not going to need a ring announcer. I'm, I'm going to have one, but I don't need her because I'm only going to have one. Aaliyah. I thought she got killed years ago. Oh, come on. 
Is that is there another one? That was a different Aaliyah. This is the one that was with Robert Stone. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, she don't make the cut. Elise Ashton, Amir Jordan, Angel Garza, Angelo Dawkins. I would argue for Angel Garza. I think Angel Garza is. You would argue for Angel. I'm making a Brian Last column down here then. Yeah, go for it. All right. Well, I'm glad you gave me the blessing. I'd hate to do anything against your will. Uh, oh, for fuck's sake. A-A-O. This woman has the first name spelled A-O-I-F-E. Your thoughts? A-O-I-F? I-F? I-F? <laughs> and her last name is Valkyrie. They signed Taya Valkyrie and made her change her name to Frankie Monet, but here is this nondescript nobody that we've never heard of. Does it have a pronunciation code in her bio? She may just be the new best-kept secret in WWE. I'll agree with that. They've fucking hidden her. Anyway, it doesn't have a pronunciation guide. All right, we're moving on. Uh, now we have Apollo Cruz. You know, I like the guy if he wasn't Nigerian carrying a spear. We may put him over to the side. Ashante Adonis. Yeah. I haven't Ash seen him. You have. No, I've seen him fucking rapping or playing records or being a DJ or whatever he's doing. Uh, Ashton Smith. Asuka. Asuka. I'll put her on your list. Put her on my list. Austin Theory you can put on my list, Austin, too. Well, Austin Theory's going on the main list. We both approve of Adam Cole, AJ Styles, and Austin Theory, I would think. I would Well, actually, I would think, but it depends on what the roster looks like at the end. If there are too many people that fit into someone else's similar kind of role, I may think differently. Well, we'll get to that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We'll get to that. As of now. Baron Von Raschke. Oh, shit. No, Baron <laughs> no, no. Corbin. I'm so, I thought I was getting excited. No, Baron Corbin don't make it. Bailey. We got to write her down even if she's hurt. Rhea Ripley, baby. Oh, no, that's just a random picture. Why do they put random pictures of other people in the middle of the superstars page? Uh, Becky Lynch. Now, she's returned, right? She qualifies. So I will put her down because a lot of people like her. Bianca Belair, I'll put her on your list and we'll do the same thing. We'll see how many girls we got at the end of this. Big E. You know what? He's a heck of an athlete, but he's been throwing pancakes and puking unicorn vomit for quite a while. So I may have to leave him off. That's my argument, too. Talented guy. He actually can deliver with intensity in the ring and in a promo, but way too much goofy shit for way too long. I'm not going to be the one to want to rehabilitate him on my show. Boa. Goodbye. Bobby Fish. Let's write him down. Bobby Fish. Bobby Lashley. Absolutely. Booker T. Now, wait a minute. Booker T has to go over on the side because he's not a wrestler. I'm not sure what he's doing there these days. Brock Lesnar. If he's available, we're putting him on our, our list. Bronson Reed. I would take him. I'm to, I'm I'm writing quickly. Uh Byron Saxton. Goodbye. Uh, yeah, goodbye. Cameron Grimes. I we want to keep we want to keep Cameron. We'll try to make him a little less silly. Candace LeRae. Goodbye. Uh Carmella. Holy mackerel. This looks like one of those fucking model sex robots that they have been building <laughs> she doesn't look like no she don't look like a real person and is this a picture or a drawing or a computer generated look she looks like one of those plastic sex robots her eyebrows don't even look real is this a real picture <laughs> i don't know who she is but it doesn't look real i believe it is a real picture <laughs> Cedric Alexander. I love Cedric from the Ring of Honor days. He's a very good athlete. We'll put him down. 
Uh, of course, Cesaro. Chad Gable. I'll take him. There we go. He will not be Shorty G. And, of course, Charlotte. We're going to take her. Corey Graves is an announcer. Dakota Kai. Yes. Yeah, and I'm putting her on your list. Hey, Damian Priest. Boom. And, the, oh my gosh, Dana Brooke. She looks more real than the picture of the other one up there. But we're we're not having a duck-billed platypie division. Danny Birch. This looks like a mugshot of a guy that blew up a fucking trailer with a meth lab. You know what? I'll take Danny Birch. You'll take Danny Birch? I'll take Danny Birch. Uh, Dave Mastiff. I have no idea who that is. <laughs> da- David Otunga. He hasn't wrestled there in 10 years, but they keep him on the roster because he's related to somebody, right? Oh, I thought it was so he didn't sue. I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, whichever. Yeah. Dexter Loomis. I have given him all kinds of shit, but I would take him because I would strip him of the ex- expressionless gimmick and let him turn loose. Dolph Ziggler. Let's write him down. Dominic Mysterio. Oh, golly, geez. I hate that, that I just couldn't do that. He looks like a nice young boy. But uh, do drop. Woo. All righty, Drake Maverick. I'm sorry. I, I, Goodbye. I know, I know the young man. I've met him. He's very polite. He's he's minute. Drew Gulak. Uh, if it was Gulas, I would take him just so that we could have George come in and manage him. Drew McIntyre, obviously. Uh, what in the Eddie Dennis? This looks like the fucking guy that was living under the trailer when the meth lab blew it up. I don't know who he is. Edge. Putting him down. Elias. And boy, does he look good in that photo. He Walk like away, Savage. Elias. Yeah, he, oh, he's jacked. He's etched. He's sculptured. He's bulked. He's got good hair. Fuck. Ember Moon. Eric with his face painted. Eva Marie. Evan T. Mack. <laughs> So many Evan people, T. Mack. Some of these people, I have no idea who they are. <laughs> Fabian Aikner. I remember he's the team of Marcel Marceau and Fabian Forte. Right. I won't take him because I have Danny Birch, and I'm not going to take a second bald guy right now unless I see how everything else plays out. There you go. Well, if you don't want a bald guy anymore in society, you're f- Finn Balor. Writing that down. Flash Morgan Webster. <laughs> I have no idea who that is. Good Lord. He, he looks like a an after-school librarian. Click the uh, picture. Click the picture. Wait a minute. I'm clicking the picture. Clicking the picture. It doesn't get any better. There's a picture. Oh, my God. Oh, wait. The picture underneath. <laughs> yeah. He's dressed like if Doink the Clown was sleeping outside a military surplus shop. <laughs> oh. Ogie dogie. We're coming back quickly to where we were before. Uh, oh, God damn it. It made me go all the way to the top. Hold on. I'm scrolling. Yeah, me too. Scrolling. It did the same thing to me. Scrolling. Yeah, you Bastards. jolly jokester. Frankie Monet. The former Taya Valkyrie. She is a talent. Looks great. Grand Metallic. Greg Hamilton in a suit and tie. Humberto Carrillo. Ilya, Ilya Dragunov. I would Ilya. take him. Elia, Elia Drag, Indy Hartwell. She's involved with the uh, same face uh, family. Io Shirai. Should I write her down on your list? Well, you know, let me just say this. If I was going to have to book it the way it is now, I would want her. But if I was starting with whoever I wanted, I'm sorry to offend anyone. I actually wouldn't have a women's division. I would start and just focus on the men's division and a tag team division. Well, no, I'm not even going to be that 
fucking strenuous. I'm going to say we're going to have our Rhea Ripley's and our Charlotte's and our Becky Lynch's, and then everybody else's. I'm not. If I'm if I'm having a promotion, everyone else right now has a women's division. I'm going to be different. I'm going to focus on just the men's division. Well, well we may pare that down too, but nevertheless. Uh, so no Io Shirai. Isaiah Swerve Scott. He's involved with the rapping, I think, that's going on now. We've seen he's painfully thin. We've seen him on NXT a number of times. Isla Dawn. Ivar. Jake At you know, Jake Atlas reminds me of Luis Arriba Martinez, except for the excitement. Luis Martinez had excitement. Well, that's nothing. The next guy on this list could also be known as not Edge. Oh my God, James <laughs> Drake looks like Edge, uh, uh, some guy from Des Moines trying to be Edge at a Halloween party. Uh, Jason Jordan, he's hurt and uh, disabled, right? Or not disabled, but you know what I'm saying. He's on the on the designated injured list or whatever. I believe that he had a neck injury and he couldn't come back from it, so I'm not sure. Well, we'll, we'll come back to that. Jackson Riker. He was a standard uh, yeah. tattooed, jacked up guy of no basic expression. Jeff Hardy. Boy, oh boy. I'm going to have to put him down because there's still, there's still name value there. But the way they've uh, been presenting him lately, you're probably taking it out on him, on him for what Matt's doing. Jerry Lawler. I'm not going to ask the king to wrestle since he'll be 72 this year and we're we're dealing with wrestlers. Jey Uso and Jimmy Uso, which one? Which one doesn't have the arrest record? I don't know if he has one or not, but nothing recent, Jey Uso. I'm going to write one Uso. <laughs> we get one Uso, whichever one's not in jail. Uno Uso. Gender Mahal. Mahal. Okay. Not interested. Jenny. J-I-N-N-Y. <laughs> no. Is she from the block? If this is the Jenny I'm thinking of, I think she's out of the UK, and I only remember that because like three or four years ago, I think she got into like a Twitter fight with Alan Blackstock. And being friends with Alan, I said, you know, let me just jump in and be a fool. And I jumped in and started giving her advice. And one of the pieces of advice I gave her was that she should have a finishing maneuver called the Jenny Tonic. And... That's the only reason I remember the name Jenny. Joke, Joaquin Wild. Joaquin, I think. Wa Joaquin Wild. Joe Coffey. John Cena. Well, he They're sticks still out. still claiming him, so we'll, <laughs> yeah, we'll take out. him if he's still on here. Uh, John Morrison, of course. Johnny Gargano. <laughs> Jojo. Jonathan Coach. Jonathan Coachman. Yeah, you could have him. For them again? You could have him on your list. I don't want him on my list. I didn't even know he was still there. I don't need some stooge kissing my ass on Twitter. Jordan Devlin, jo Joseph Connors. A lot of these people are just shirtless and all look the same. Hair, beard, no shirt. Uh, Jordan Devlin, Joseph Connors, Casey Catanzaro, Karrion Cross. We got to write down. I'll take him, yeah. Karrion Cross. You see, automatically, we've weeded out a lot of people. Kaylee Ray. I thought she, didn't, was she the one that retired? And keeps retiring every no, time no, she gets no. booked, she retires? That's another one. That's, you sure that's not Kaylee Ray? I think it's Kylie Ray. Oh, well, that makes all the difference. Caden Carter, Kayla Braxton, Keith Lee. Are we ever going to see this guy again? Something's going on there. It's got to be medical. You one would think. Um, we love the way that he moves for his size and some of the shit that he does looks fantastic and he talks like Fraser Crane and we despise his interviews. I think I heard somewhere, and I don't know how true this is because I have not looked into it, that there's a trademark issue. That both he and WWE at the same time tried to trademark his name. Oh, for fuck's sake. If if he is being if, if he's being kept off television because he's trying to trademark what they want to trademark, then he's a complete idiot. Because he he's not John Cena, he's not The Rock, he's not Steve Austin. He hasn't become a big star yet. 
they he needs to get them to let him on TV however he can be on TV and get over. If if <laughs> if he was trademarking it first though, and then out of nowhere without even telling him they tried to trademark it and he hears about it through his attorney, I can understand being a little peeved about that. How did he sign up with them and didn't is he trying to ca- trademark the name Keith Lee? I would assume because that is his name. Okay, but if he signed a contract with them, it clearly states they have the rights to his name. While he works there. So what he needs to do is come up, he should have done then, come up with another name that they wanted to call him. I don't, I, either trademark your name and then go there and and be good enough that they'll use it, or fucking realize that they're going to trademark all your shit. You can't have it both ways. I don't agree with it. But when he's he's old, he's in his 30s, his window is closing, he needs to be a star pretty quickly, and he wasn't... He His work gets over first time you see it, but his fucking promos and personality don't because he talks, as I've mentioned, like a goddamn geometry professor so he don't have the obviously the leverage to tell them what they're going to fucking trademark or not which is why we haven't seen him on television in however many months if that is indeed the case if that is indeed the case we don't know for sure so anyway but the next guy appears to have stolen with a question mark i was gonna say the next guy appears to have stolen kushida's outfit what the kenny williams is wearing a what is that is that a is it a vest or is it a it looks like a vest on top of a it's shirt. A, it's a vest that says SCA on top of a flannel shirt. Kevin Owens. I would take him. Because now that he's got a better attitude and he does what he's told, uh, he might be easier to work with. No. Kofi, huh? No, he won't be. Well, probably not. I'll I'll mark him down for now. Kofi Kingston. Same thing, New Day. Good God. Just rotten. The the pancakes and the cereal and the colors and the... But, you know, but, but I haven't seen enough of him being able to overlook that gimmick to know whether or not you could do something with him if you took it off. We'll come back. Kona Reeves. Kushida. Kushida is wearing elbow pads and no shirt instead of street clothes. Apparently, he does have some type of gear. Kyle O'Reilly. We must put down immediately. Of course, and I like the fact that he now dresses like Vib from the Young Ones. <laughs> L.A. Knight. I'm going to put old Eli down, too. I've never seen him, actually. He's he's a good worker, and he can talk, and he's a, he's fresh, at least. He's, he's a new face that actually has some experience instead of all these, you know, performance center people. Lacey Evans, good guy. Leon Ruff. Leon gained 75 pounds, and we'll talk. I'll take him. What? I'll take him. We'll take Leon Ruff. Louis, boy, that's a squeaky chair. Lewis <laughs> Howley. Lince Dorado, a guy with a name with a mask on. Liv Morgan. Mace. <laughs> Malcolm Bivens. <laughs> Look at that photo from Mace. <laughs> Mace he looks like, what am I doing here? <laughs> Even through the mask, you could see his confusion. Malcolm Bivens looks like he's trying to rip off old Clarence Mason's gimmick. I'll take him. You'll take Malcolm Bivens? I need a manager. I'll take him. We haven't got to Heyman yet. That's going to be mine, you know. So you get Malcolm Bivens. I'll take Malcolm Bivens. I'll take the talent that has nothing but potential. All right. Mandy Rose. Mansoor. (laughs) <laughs> Marcel Barthel, Mark Andrews, Mark Coffey, Maurice, Matt Camp. He, Who he is looks, that? Who Matt is that? Camp looks like a fucking <laughs> middle-aged child psychologist. You know, he, like, Who is he, that guy? <laughs> he looks, either that or it's a, can, a candid photo of your local TV weatherman. What the? F- Mackenzie Mitchell. Miko Satamura. I'll take Mackenzie Mitchell for my backstage interviewer oh, or whatever I want to use her for. She's I didn't good. I know we were doing interviewers and shit. All right. Well, then you, I'm. You put someone to the side. You put Booker T to the side before. I'm putting Mackenzie to the side. 
Well, because he's a wrestler. But all right, then I'm putting Lawler over here to the side on mine since we're doing okay. announcers things. Mercedes Martinez. I'll take her. She's a pro. Um, God damn it. We're only to the M's. Michael Cole. Mike Rome. Montez Ford. Wait a minute. Alphabetically, here's Mr. McMahon. She... <laughs> <laughs> not, <laughs> not Vince McMahon under the V's, but Mr. McMahon under the M. Not Mr. M-I. It's M-R. It's the R that put it between Montez and Mustafa. Yeah. But it's his first name is not Mr. anyway. <laughs> Mustafa Ali. MVP. I'll, I'll take, take MVP. I'll take MVP. I'll, I'll put him on the main list. You will we'll, we'll break this up in a succeeding program. We're just trying to field a team here now. Naomi. If I'm having women, I'll have Naomi. <laughs> if you're having women, have you changed your philosophy? As, as Jim Barnett once famously said, if I'm having women, I'll have Naomi. No, I have Naomi on my roster. I don't know if I'm going to have a women's division. All right. Well, I'm not going to take Naomi unless the Flying Burrito Brothers come with her. I'll take them too. Nash Carter, Natalia. All right, I'll take Natalia. Uh, you want Nia Jax? Nope. Nigel McGinnis, because we're taking announcers now. So there you go. Nikki Ash. A S H is is uh, abbreviated. A dot a s dot a a dot s dot h Ash. Regardless, Nina Samuels, Noam Dar. He's related to Noam Pinsky. Oliver Carter. Omos. He's a fucking giant. Let's see what we can get out of him. Oni Lorcan. Otis. Now, Paige. Paige is no longer wrestling, right? No longer wrestling. I'll take Otis. You'll take Otis? Not in that gimmick, but I'll take Otis. Well, then we've 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 uh eliminated the new day on the based on their shitty gimmick. So uh, if we're re-gimmicking, I'll put Big E down. Uh what about Paige? Paige wrestling these days or is Paige just on here? She had a bad neck. She had to retire. That's what I heard. I don't even know what she does on air, if anything, but it would be just an on-air personality, I think, right All now. Right. Well, I never let. Paul Heyman, let me write him down twice, since he's the most talented guy in the company. I'll give you a percent of the company, Paul. <laughs> Come to my side. Pete Dunn. Do we have to take his fake tan? I don't want Pete Dunn. Yeah, our truth. If he hadn't been that, the whole twenty four seven thing is just no. I can't tell you. He, I, he was a talent years ago, but now they've just made him a fucking flim flam man. Rampage Brown, Randy Orton. Let me write that down. Boom. Raquel Gonzalez. There is something there. She's huge. She's got a look. Raul Mendoza. Reckoning is reckoning from that gimmick they've already put the kibosh on already. Based on the photo, it looks like Mia Yim, doesn't it? I would. Well, I think it was, but I, I are they done or whatever? I'm a, I might take Mia Yim. I don't want no reckoning, but uh, I don't want Reginald. I'll take Reginald. Reg You'll t what? If I, if he can learn how to do a promo to get people to hate him, and he can take bumps, I'll take him. Well, you just get Leo Rush. I don't want no. That way you don't have to learn. He's just an idiot. <laughs> or you got Reginald from Cirque de Boucher. Exactly. Right. He's a professional. I won't have All to worry right. about any you, of the drama. You take Reginald. I'll take Ray Mysterio and Rhea Ripley. Ricochet. Would you take Ricochet? No. Are you kidding us? That one fucking one minute clip of them doing that Cirque de Soleil routine. Uh, a while back was enough to turn me off to that completely. I'll take Ricochet, but I, I'd want to put him in a mask again like he was in Lucha Underground. He looked cooler then. Well, yeah, because a small guy with no fucking descript look looks cool if he's flying around in a mask. Riddick Moss. Riddle. Do we want Riddle? I wouldn't. I don't. Yeah. Ridge Holland. 
when he well he got his leg broken by the idiot diving on him so when he comes back rinku rinku i have no idea who he is but based I, on the picture he has an interesting look i'd take him well let's give you rinku uh ron gronkowski absolutely robert rude write that down boom robert stone phony as a football bat roderick strong my god they do have a lot of talent but i I wish we'd been counting how many we've weeded through roman reigns ryan papola it looks know. like a no, grinning no. guy you would use a, a, on an advertisement. Sam Gradwell, Sam Stoker, Sammy Zayn. What do you think about old Sammy? I would take Sammy Zayn. I'll take Sammy. I've had him before, but that was generico. Samoa Joe, yes, please. Yes. Uh, Santos Escobar. Saray. Sasha Banks. I would take Sasha Banks now. You want Sasha Banks over there? Yeah, she's only a big star that people love. Yeah. Well, we got several women over here on this other lynch. Or on this other list. I on saw this other ledge? Well, on this other lynch. No, it's not as good as I saw Banks. <laughs> Sarov. Saxon Hurley. Scarlet. We got to have Scarlet because she goes with Karrion Cross. Yeah. No, she's good. I mean, whatever she does, she seems committed to, so she's good. Well, I don't want her to wrestle. I want her to be with Karrion Cross. Yeah. Scott Stanford, he looks like somebody from J.P. Morgan Chase. He's a um, sports guy here on Channel 4 in New York. Yeah. Seth Rollins, we're writing him down. I wouldn't I'm, take him. You wouldn't take Seth? I, he needs to go away for a while. I can get something out of Seth. I could, too, if he became a mute. <laughs> Sh- we'll skip over Shane McMahon. Shayna Baszler. Didn't they just fire her? No. They fired her friends, her two friends. Oh, okay, that's right. No, they just made her look like a piece of shit doing something to her. Uh, Seamus. My God, look at Seamus's outfit. A white T-shirt with suspenders and a felt hat. Hmm. Sheldon Benjamin. Got to write him down. Yeah. Shinsuke Nakamura. I'll take him. You want him? He's weird to me. He's weird and he's misused, and he's fantastic when used correctly, and I loved him in New Japan. I'll yeah, you. Shotzi Blackheart. No, thank you. Sid Scala. Oh, Sid. Oh, I mean, when you're talking Slap, about Sid. Slapjack. Here on this line, there's four pictures of four talents on this, this row. It goes Slapjack, Stephanie McMahon, T-Bar, and T-Bone. <laughs> I'll take T-Bar. T-Bar was what? Dijakovic, right? I don't know. I can't. I I think that was Dijakovic, so I'll take him. All right. Well, then let's, let's I'll both write down T-Bar if that's Donovan Dijakovic. Why? I don't know why they have a T-Bar and a T-Bone in the same company. And a company. T-Bone. <laughs> Tamina. Tegan Knox. Brian Kendrick. The Fiend. Let's stay far away from that. The Miz. I didn't realize Brian Kendrick was still there. Well, the, some of these are, are loose affiliations. Timothy Thatcher. Take him. Take him. Tim Thatcher. Titus O'Neil. I'll take him. And what are you, what's he going to do? I don't care. Do, for your, for your fa- fantasy wrestling promotion, you're already doing fucking public relations? Okay, I'm going to make him the commissioner. Has, Boom. has he wrestled in fucking 15 years? He's my commissioner. Titus O'Neil is your commissioner. I'm going to make him my commissioner. All right, God damn it! I'm making Adam Pierce my commissioner, motherfucker. How about that? And then we can have a match between them. Okay. Tommaso Champa. I'll write that down quickly. I'm running out of room here on this piece of paper I was using. Tony Storm. Boy, she looks she looks like a star. I'm gonna have to put her down. They're calling her up, you know. She's going to SmackDown, I think. Well, I see. I put her down, and they call her up. Trent seven. I'll wait till he gets to Trent eight or nine. Triple H. Tyler Bate. I'll take Triple H. You'll wait a minute. You can't take Triple H. I need an office boy. God. All right. 
Then if you take Triple H, do I get to take The Undertaker, who is still on the roster page? You're going to have The Undertaker if I can get vacant, which is next to it. And isn't that, oh my. <laughs> Why is there a spot on the roster for vacant? Vacant <laughs> in between The Undertaker and Wade Barrett. <laughs> well, you know, this piece of property has been hard to rent. I understand that the code officials have been over here. The plumbing, <laughs> it's vacant. All right, let's skip. I won't take The Undertaker and you don't get vacant, but we're taking Valter. We're definitely taking Valter. Yes. Wesley, who is next to Wild Boar, who <laughs> has no teeth in his mouth, who is next to Wolfgang, who looks <laughs> like he's the Wild Boar, except he's not smiling, so you can't see whether he has teeth. Xavier Woods. That Young man used to be in TNA when I was there, Young Consequences Creed. And he was a very, very fine young man, but he's been in New Day. We're going to have, we're going to put New Day, all three of them, over here on the side to figure out could we wash the taste of that ridiculous gimmick out of everybody's mouths? I would take him so I had someone from my video game division. All right. Zia Brookside, nope. Zia Lee. I take her. I need a locker nope. room enforcer. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, then everybody else on your roster is going to be on the injured list. Zach Gibson, Zelina Vega, and Zoe Stark. So how I have written down 70 names here. We had to go through over 150 people. We got to count those on, on another, on another time off the air. We'll yeah. count everybody and we'll come back. But, they got a ton of talent. How the fuck is it that the shows are so boring? Because they don't have a ton of talent backstage. All right, we're going to we're, we're gonna, I've got this list now and we're going to uh in the next installment of this on probably next week's show, we're going to pare this down to something baby faces and heels and we're we're going to polish this until we've got an all-star WWE roster that you could do something with and we've eliminated all the dreck. That's what we're going to do. Because we've done this much work now. I didn't know this would be that much work. Yeah, this one. I around. honestly didn't think we'd get this many names. There's a lot of things that, you know, it's weird. Everyone complained about the gimmicks for so many years, but there's a lot of names that are just, they're names. I don't mean like they're names that people know, but it's just like someone just drew up a name and it's just a generic guy with no shirt here staring at you. When I first got into WWF, and again, that's when a lot of the hardcore fans didn't like it. But everyone stood out as being unique. Different, unique. Everyone. You could tell them apart in a 20,000-seat arena. You could be in the back row, and you would be able to tell the wrestlers apart. No more. There's a lot of just generic faces, generic names, and everyone works the same. And But they're not even really generic names because they'll try to change them up. They'll make up weird names and then try to change up the spelling. It's like, you know... I went to Wendy's one time. You know they got the name tags on, right? The cashier, I'm looking, just minding my own business, looking around. I look at her name tag. It says Quantasia. How many times, how many children's name books is Quantasia in? But they, this, they just make up weird names that are allegedly presented as these people's, as they say, Christian names, but they're just offbeat fucking names that don't really make a lot of sense either that or just bland shit that uh well there's old fucking otis i don't know if you sign well, there they give you a name what do you think it would be like telly dancing <laughs> what now just i'm trying to come up with a wwe name for you from someone from that telly era dancing well, half ted dancing half half telly savalas yes i'm not bold doesn't matter. Don't run a bar. Oh, so you think it needs to be someone more like you? Well, I mean, one would think. Okay. I need to think about something options. more true to life. Anyway, like Wolfgang. Wolfgang. Would... T Bone. I see you as a T Bone kind of guy. <laughs> well, that was one of the, that was one of George Costanza's co-workers. That's right. Fucking <laughs> nickname. Wasn't it T Bone? <laughs> All right. Uh, hey. The ocean called, they're all out of shrimp. That's okay. The idiot store called, they're all out of you. No, no. What? It's the jerk store. Or the jerk store called. 
the jerk story. Yeah, well, I had sex with your wife. <laughs> His wife is in a coma. Anyway, uh, are you in a coma on your programs on the Arcadian Vanguard Network this fine week? Of course, another action pack week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcast or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes. The latest episode of the Mid-South Wrestling Television Review with myself and Mike Mills is out right now at midsouthpod.com or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Hear Dusty Rhodes go America on everybody. And he going all America? He invents words in the midst of his promo. <laughs> Hear it today as well as our analysis of it. The Mid-South Wrestling Television Review, midsouthpod.com. A ribbit of gurgy. Also want to make mention of the latest... That was a dusty word. You don't remember a ribbit of gurgy? No, when did he use that? In a Florida promo in like the fucking early 80s. He was getting all fired up and it was like a... He was given a battle cry like a ribbit of gurgy, baby. Yeah. Well, this week on the Super Stud Cast... I from... actually checked into a hotel on the road in the early 90s when Dusty was doing the color on the TBS Saturday night show. You remember that? Yeah. Dusty was the color. color uh, unfortunately, yeah. And whoever was in the room before me had left the closed captioning on, on the television. And the closed captioning was trying to keep up with Dusty Rhodes. And you have never seen such gibberish. And at one point, it was almost like the captioning started stuttering, trying to figure out what was going on. I swear I could see the television smoking. It made no sense at all. Trying to close caption Dusty Rhodes. Well, someone who makes lots of sense, of course, is Ron Fuller, the Tennessee stud. And this week on the Super Studcast for patrons of Ron Fuller Studcast at patreon.com slash studcast. Ron speaks with New Japan Pro Wrestling's English commentator, Kevin Kelly, for a fun talk about Kevin's career in and around professional wrestling from the WWF to so much more. Hear it today, patreon.com slash studcast. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! <laughs> that was the best one in a while. Uh, go through <laughs> the archives today at 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcast, The Mothership. You know, one time they had, uh, people have sent me, actually more than one time, people have sent me uh, screenshots of one of the, I think it was the Steve Austin broken skull thing or whatever with, with Kane. I think it was, it was, they were, they were telling a story about me and t something about old smoky mountain, whatever, but somehow the closed captioning turned something like cornet mint into coordinated ass mints. <laughs> what? So instead of cornet meant to do this, or what coordinated ass meant is what that that was. All right. <laughs> anyway, we've given the wrestling history. We've talked about tidbits and gone over everything else. It's time now for the cosplay wrestling highlight of the week, the AEW review of July 14th, the first time back with fans. They actually had their fans, and they were a screaming, yelling bunch. They, outside of I'm Jacksonville, looking, of course. Uh, well, and outside of Jacksonville, yes, they're in Austin, Texas, and they haven't had any wrestling there in quite some time because of the pandemic, so they're all fired up for it. And I looked at the people, and they're going nuts. It's This reminds me, in a lot of ways, of an ECW crowd, especially in the early days. It's a fad crowd. They're not looking for wrestling. They're looking for chaos and bullshit. But whereas the people, the ECW fans were looking for violent, bloody chaos and bullshit, these people are just looking for silliness and chaos and bullshit because the style has changed. But they're all young. That's what concerns me the most. And that's why I... As soon as I knew when was going to be, who was going to be involved in this thing, I thought this is not going to be good because these people are not old enough to have actually seen wrestling before. So they think that this is wrestling. That's why they're, they are 
they're basically indoctrinating a whole age group of people that this is what pro wrestling is supposed to be. And it's fucking embarrassing. And that's, and I knew this was going to happen. And that's why I was hoping that old Tony Khan would come to his senses and not get in business with who he was going to get in business with, but it's come to pass. And the entrance of the formerly balding plumber, now all the way bald plumber, the CEO of Moxley plumbing, at least this made sense. It was like Sandman and ECW. You know, once the bell rings and the match starts, it's going to be the shits, but the entrance, he's out there with the people. They're playing the music. They like it. He likes that's the best part of the fucking thing. It didn't make any sense for the last year and a half when he was wandering in to an empty amphitheater of 5,000 empty seats from the parking lot like he just couldn't dress with the boys because they don't like him or whatever. This at least made sense. He's out there with the fucking people. It was it Sandmanish to you? Nah, not really. And I'm not saying that as a put down. It was different. I think, you know, Wild Thing and Sandman are different. It's a different feeling that you give the crowd with the music. Which do you like better, Wild Thing or, Sa or Inner Sandman? As a song or as an entrance yeah, song? as an entrance song. As anything. As a song, Wild Thing kicks at Enter Sandman's ass. Cause oh, come on. I'm not a big Metallica fan. I don't give a shit about Metallica anyway, but Enter Sandman is a classic song. Enter Sandman's all right. I'm, I would never listen to it in the car or anything, but when, you know, like Mariano Rivera used to come out at the Yankee games to Enter Sandman, and the Yankee fans seemed to like that. But, you know, the Sandman had woman and he had missy he didn't have eddie kingston bopping around <laughs> behind him while he went through the crowd right. you got me there either <laughs> woman or missy would probably be better for the shot than eddie kingston i think even he'd admit that but anyway um the u.s title is recognized by new japan pro wrestling on the line here moxley is the champion of course defending it here in this company against carl anderson who's been with new japan for years and years and so I'm thinking, okay, maybe they're going to have a, uh, unlike most AEW matches, they're going to be serious. They're going to follow the rules. This is a U.S. title match from New Japan. Both these guys make money with New Japan. They're going to treat this seriously. They're going to have a championship match. They're not going to have all the fall to all they usually have. This is what I'm thinking ahead of time, right? But then suddenly... <laughs> Eddie, it's a jump start. Eddie Kingston just blows into Gallows and starts beating on him. Moxley jump starts on Anderson. Kingston and Gallows fight off into the arena, and suddenly the all action in the ring stops um, for a second while they look at each other, Anderson and Moxley, and then they proceed to exchange, and I count it, 38 fake-looking forearms. They're trying to do a one-two in the middle of the ring, but neither one's throwing a punch, because I guess neither one can throw a punch, because why wouldn't you if you can? Instead, literally, fake-looking forearms that hit nobody, land on nothing, and they don't sell any of them. They're just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, 38. And then once they finish with that, they immediately go to the floor fight over to the ramp and start suplexing each other on the fucking entrance ramp. This is in the first two minutes. They can't even have a straight title match when it's a, somebody else's title that they have and they're, they're fucking, they were on the floor for a minute and a half while the referee stayed in the ring and I guess took that opportunity to rub one out. They used the, the gimmicks on the floor, etc. Anderson took over by kicking to start the heat by kicking Moxley off the apron of the ring onto the floor. And he took a bump and he milked being counted out of the ring. After they just fought out of the ring for a minute and a half, both of them, and the referee did nothing. Now he's laying there and the referee's counting and he's going to milk like, Oh my God, could he be counted out? The rules only make any difference in this company when they want to do a spot involving a rule otherwise there are no rules whatsoever they did more back and forth and this was a match with moxley in it and they're all the fucking same thing it wasn't silly or funny it's just this 
between Moxley's physique and his work and the psychology of his work, the way he calls matches and the way he sells or doesn't sell, depending on whether the spot that he's called calls for him to sell or not, his matches are fucking rotten. And this was, it's, it, so then remember the paradigm shift, the, the fucking finish he was doing where it's a double arm DDT. Yeah. Okay. After they've done all this shit to each other, he grabs Anderson and hooks him for the double arm DDT, but just picks him up and kind of a shitty double arm suplex where he didn't drop him on his head for a DDT. He just dropped him over on his back, but they called it the paradigm shift and acted like it was a DDT. And that one, two, three. Meanwhile, it takes a bazooka to get Moxley or anybody else on this program to sell anything or to remember the second rope, top rope tombstone pile driver from last week and the, but this and that and the other thing. And we'll have more examples in this program. But this bump didn't look like it would beat my Aunt Lola, and that was it. One, two, three. Because that's his finish. He just either didn't want to... Maybe Anderson has a bad neck and said, don't fucking give me that goddamn finish the way you usually do. I don't know. But did you... What'd you see that I didn't see here? Because that's pretty much it. I'm not a fan of Moxley or his matches. This was no different. I thought Carl Anderson looked okay, but the match layout didn't do it for me. I didn't like it at all. I hate the idea that titles just randomly appear on this show. I mean, the first two matches are, one of them's a title for another organization. Another one's a bullshit title. <laughs> Not a real title. Yeah, and those are the first two matches. I didn't like this. I don't like his matches. I just don't what, think Moxley's What was with matches. the finish? Did he did he not hit it and they just acted like he did? Or did he mean to do that on purpose like that? Who? I have no idea. And if I could say one positive, no matter what I think, the people there were into the personalities. There were points during matches where people just waited for something to happen, but they were into a John Moxley going through the crowd. Yes. And all those people are into all this stuff. And as I said, that's part of the problem. And I know now somebody's going, oh, Cornette's mad when the fans like it. No, there's still not very many of these fucking people and nobody is going to fucking could follow along for this they're not making new fans they're using or or working on the same existing fans that they have which is the people that they've been able to teach that this is fucking wrestling this substandard phony silly fake fucking product that they do is wrestling to some of these people and that's why they like it but for a wrestling fan or for anybody to hop on board with this thing, they got to start trying to make some people believe in some shit to get some people over. So what they're doing right now is just muddying the water and making some of these young people think this is wrestling and it's embarrassing. Anyway, Lance Archer did a promo. Jake was upset for some reason, but I couldn't understand why. And then he wandered out and Archer wants a rematch with Moxley for the U S title. And next week, since they're in Texas again, it's going to be a Texas death match. Not because they've built to the stipulation or not because they've worked a previous match that called for that. They've switched the title back and forth between them a time or two. But they're having a Texas death match because they're in the state of Texas. Well, he did say that I guess they previously in New Japan had a Texas death match. I don't know. I don't understand. I don't. They didn't have a Texas death match in New Japan. Does New Japan have Texas death matches? I don't know, but this is not your father's they, New Japan. Well, no, but he he lost the title to Moxley in New Japan. I don't think it was a Texas death match. Maybe I don't. Wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. You usually are. <sighs> Alex, the interpreter was with Andre Olio Leo and his assistant. And he cut a promo with more subtitles for Andre, whether he speak in English or Spanish. The, the Spanish interpreter for Penthouse is trying to interview the, the Hispanic wrestler who's speaking English and Spanish, and you can't understand either one, so they got subtitles, but he's looking for the, the death triangle, which is Penthouse, Felix, and Pac that Alex is affiliated with sometimes 
except everybody's looking for Pac because since he lives in England and he can't get back and forth easily, he's been missing. And Felix is apparently still injured for one of the many times that he misses some of that shit he does and lands on his fucking head. So everybody's looking for the death triangle. But now they're going to have this heel looking for these other heels or something. Maybe he wants to be friends. <laughs> Next up, the second title match out of two matches so far on this show that you indicated before is for a title that doesn't even exist, the FTW title. The history of the FTW title in All Elite Wrestling is when Taz came in and formed Team Taz, he presented the FTW title which, of course, as we all know, is from ECW 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, and stands for Fuck the World. That's what he, uh, the title he established in his own title in ECW. And they made a big deal out of it then. He defended it, I think, once several months ago, and then sometimes he carries it around and sometimes he doesn't, but we really haven't heard much about it since then because Team Taz has been in the middle of losing everything that they've been involved in and or splitting up acrimoniously. Have I, have I, did I get that history right? Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Okay, so now the FTW title is on the line where Brian Cage is going to defend it against Ricky Starks, a teammate in Team Taz, but Brian Cage has been lately not having any fucking patience for the rest of Team Taz and wanting to do things the right way. Of course, Starks has just come back from the last time he wrestled on their television, and Adam Page broke his fucking neck. It was Adam Page, right? Gave him the German suplex, was, he landed yeah. on his head, broke his neck, and popped up and didn't sell it and finished the match. And boy, did I think he broke his neck a few times early in this match, too. I was about to say, should he be wrestling so soon, to be, especially against Brian Cage? Within the first 15 seconds... Brian Cage fucked up a hip toss. He he got him up in the air, and then it looked like instead of a regular hip toss, he was going to do one of those things where they turn the guy over and he lands on a knee or whatever, but he couldn't figure out what he was doing, and he, so he brought him up in the hip toss, and then he just kind of, oh shit, he lost him, and he kind of cushioned his fall to the ground, and they went down in a heap. That was in 15 seconds. Brian Cage is robotic. He has no facial expressions. He goes in a matter-of-fact manner from one move to another like he's memorized it, which, good reason for that, because he has. And he looks like, a, he looks great. He's a beast. He's got that great physique. And every time he goes into spots, he looks like he is memorizing or has memorized what he's doing, and he goes from one thing to another just like that. There's no spontaneity. There's no reaction like, oh shit, when somebody counters something, he knows exactly what's going to happen because it's all set up. And he goes through it by rote, move by move. No passion in it. He walks through it like a preset routine. Uh, they did picture in picture during the break and I had to, I don't normally don't watch because it's so small anyway, right? But I had to back up a little bit because as soon as they came back from the picture in picture on the other side of the break, they were already into a move where they both fell in a heap. And so I had to go back and figure it out and I couldn't figure out what they were trying to do, but they fell in a heap. Did you catch that coming right back from the break or were you paying close enough attention? I didn't see what they were trying to do, but I will say in general, this match was a was the biggest expose of Brian Cage that I've seen. He was not good here in any sense of the word. And it can't be, St Starks is fantastic. Starks has personality. Starks can work. He's had good matches. We praised his promos. Yeah. He was working his ass off here. And by the way, he was, he, he didn't have anything to work with. He was working his ass off to the point where the fans decided they were going to go with the heel and the heel stable instead of the baby well, face. Yes. And, and, well, but here's another thing. Yes, we'll get to that in a second. But it, oh God, I, did you see the part where Starks, 
he shoulder blocked Cage. Cage went back into the ropes. He hit him with a shoulder block in the gut. And then Starks had to bend down and literally put himself in a headlock so that he could shoot Brian Cage off because Cage was just standing there. And as as you mentioned, the people are Starks because Starks has energy and personality and people are liking him anyway. And they've completely, by by switching Brian Cage as a secondary role, as a stooge and a muscle man in a group, is fine. But they're breaking the wrong one out of this pack. They went on the floor forever. Nobody was counted out. And the reason why they, that they constantly do this in every match and bury the referee at every single time is because they are sitting in the back setting up their match and they're setting shit up with no thought as to how long it takes because you can see them going from one thing to another. Some they're not improvising a lot of this shit on the floor. They have clearly decided that's what they're going to do. They just never figure how long it's going to take. And they don't have, if they do have a responsible agent, then they're obviously not listening to them because any responsible agent would say, okay, wait a minute. You've done this, 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 this. You're still out on the floor. You've been out there for a minute and a half. So there's just no quality control. Anyway, they did more back and forth. There was a nice deal where Starks got out from under Brian Cage and picked him up when he was standing on the ropes and powerbombed him for a two count, and they actually sold it. And that was a nice pop. And then Starks goes to grab the FTW belt that he's going to hit Brian Cage with when Brian Cage turns around, but Hobbs and Hook are at ringside, the other members of Team Taz, and Taz is on color. And as Starks goes for the belt and goes turn around like he's going to hit the guy, Hobbs jerks the belt away from Ricky Starks. And Starks looks shocked. And then Cage catches him with a sloppy F5 on a man that's just coming back from a fucking broken neck and gets a two count. So now they're turning on Starks, except then Hook draws the referee, Cage goes for a clothesline, Starks ducks the clothesline, and when Cage gets to the ropes, because of his momentum, Hobbs takes the belt, he's just jerked away from Ricky Starks and hits Brian Cage over the head with it. And then Starks hits a spear on him and pins Cage one, two, three. How did this make any sense? Starks goes to cheat. Hobbs stops Starks from cheating, potentially costing him the match. He didn't know. Hobbs would have no way of knowing that Starks was going to kick out of the F5 that Cage gave him. And then the very next movement, Hobbs takes the belt that he pulled away from Starks so that Starks couldn't hit Cage with it and clocks Cage over the head with it himself. What the fuck is going on here? It makes no sense. (laughs) But the crowd loved it. Big pop for Ricky Starks and the heel team of Team Taz. Yes, they cheered the heels out of the building. I mean, anything that makes Cage look like the schlub he is is okay with me, but... This made no sense whatsoever. The guy's own team tried to stop him from winning, almost cost him the match, and then immediately turn around and cheat for him so he will win. This sounded like some shit shit Shitstain would come up with after a dinner at Taco Bell. Anyway, did you see then Cody? You know, Cody is the master of psychology. He's very subliminal. Cody, the baby face, comes out in a white suit, and Malachi Black is wearing a black suit. He got a white suit, black suit. The only thing that Cody should have done here was got color. And then he would have fucking, it would have been perfect. <clears throat> Let me see if I can relay this information to the fans. Cody comes out to the desk, puts on a headset because he's mad. He's screaming, pissing mad. He's cutting a promo on Tommy End or Malachi Black. Now they're using both names. Um, but then he says, no, I'm not making my point. So he grabs a PA mic and he goes to the ring. And he calls out 
both guys, Tommy End and Malachi Black. Malachi Black shows up on the screen, of course, in front of what looked to be a brush fire. Was that what he was? The smoke, it was one of those West Western uh, U.S. brush fires that we're hearing about because there was smoke everywhere. I'm surprised he didn't have to be treated with oxygen. And he told an, a story about a guy shooting a prized stallion horse, which was kind of an updated version of Terry Funk's promo about his dad taking that stray dog out behind the barn. Kind of an updated version of that. Malachi Black was calm. Cody was going batshit. He was screaming. Suddenly, there was a blackout. And when the lights came on, you will never guess, but that meant that Malachi Black was in the ring. And they immediately, white suit and black suit, go to a pull apart. And everybody comes out and pulls them apart because this was one of the spots in the show where they were told to come out and pull people apart that were fighting. So they were there instantly, as opposed to other unscheduled fights where they're not told to come out and nobody ever even fucking, you don't see anybody. I have heard that this Tommy End was the guy that Paul Lee wanted to beat Brock Lesnar and make him the top baby face. Is that what you've heard? I had not heard that, no. I Somebody said on the internet, Heyman was high on this guy and it was... In Heyman's mind, it was between Tommy End and Drew McIntyre as who was going to beat Brock last year at WrestleMania. And Vince, of course, if we know how it went because Vince jumped in on that one. I like that the guy looks like a fucking weirdo and his kick, his kicks last week on Cody and Arn were fine. And apparently he's got a following, but the, the promo instilled no fear in anybody he's got a normal voice and and i i don't see this i that's where i was gobsmacked the Heyman would want to put this guy over brock if that is indeed the case uh we'll see what happened this wasn't bad but uh we'll see what happens i don't know what they're already they've he's been on tv twice and they've confused his introduction with multiple names and I, I, we know he's going after Cody, but I, I don't know what the fuck's going on here with this guy. And I, I, I've been told that, oh, we're just, it's completely our fault because he released videos on social media explaining his name. Well, good. Then they should have gathered up some of them videos he released on social media and played them on their fucking television program. Your thoughts. By and large, I thought it was a good segment, but like most things in AEW, even though there are moments that I think hit perfectly, then there's other stuff that I go, just why are you doing this? I actually saw some criticism of this from AEW fans. I told you, there's a whole contingent now that hate Cody, no matter what. And I've criticized Cody a lot for things that I thought were badly done or poorly thought out. I didn't think this was one of those examples. I thought Cody coming out there and getting on the mic at the desk was great yeah it showed fire this was something that would have worked in classic wrestling and then he gets to the ring and i'm still thinking this is great this is cody doing something that actually has some feeling for the first time in a very long time of course cody comes back as soon as the fans are back notice and then he gets in the ring and that video comes up and i'm like fuck it's smackdown now this guy is doing a skit yeah i mean he's a bad guy it's a bad guy skit it's not a comedy skit but he's doing a skit with a smoke machine, just constantly the smoke going everywhere. And then again, the guy's been here for two weeks. Learn the first thing you do in AEW, become friends with the lighting guy, because then the lights go out again and he's <laughs> in the ring. And that's where I thought things picked up again. And it was great. I thought Cody at the desk and Cody fired up was great. I thought Cody and Malachi Smith, kind of like spy versus spy, white versus black. It looked good. Both guys were intense. Cody really upped the intensity. But I could do without, all of a sudden, Cody doesn't know there's going to be this video that was pre-recorded with smoke. Who recorded it and where? Why were they sitting on it? Why did they decide to play it now? Yeah. Why did the lights go out? If you can get around all the illogical, stupid <laughs> shit, there was good stuff here. So by and large, it was good for AEW. 
But now remember, the people that are writing and creating things in AEW have been watching WWE television and or on it for the past 15 years. So they think this shit's normal, too. That's the thing. So many of these things that drive me nuts that ECW popularized, like the lights going out for no good reason. Yeah. That was done because they couldn't figure out a reason. It was just, oh, let's just turn the lights out, turn it back on. It or works the, or, once. And, and also, as, as Paul Lee mentioned through Chris Candido to me, when they would have to have a surprise because they were short a surprise. So they'd just turn the lights out and put somebody in the ring and turn it back on. There's our surprise. To me, it's lame. To me, it's lame and lazy, and I think it's unnecessary. All right, well, in the further destruction of Tully Blanchard's Hall of Fame career, Officer Barb Brady catches Tully while he's coming in by himself. He's walking in without his guys, coming into the arena, wheeling his bag. They're on camera, and suddenly they just walk over to the elevator, and they're not hiding, just sitting there in plain sight, two grown adult men over six feet tall, graduates of major universities, Santana and Ortiz, are there and just grab him. It's, it's, it's like, what the fuck? It was like, they couldn't have been more obvious if they had neon signs on them. He's walking straight toward them. And suddenly when the camera widens out and there they are, oh my gosh. And they grab him and tease hitting him with a crowbar, but they don't. And they let him go and walk off. And Tully says, I'm going to get my boys. Remember when Tully Blanchard was one of the biggest names in wrestling. And remember when he actually used to do shit instead of just wander around and be made to look like a fucking moron? By the way, if I worked in AEW, in the world of kayfabe, if I worked in AEW, yeah. as soon as I saw Alex Marvez, i pull out a machete. Oh, I'm fucking running. Yeah, there's someone there ready to get me as soon as yeah. I see Marvez. <laughs> More on that later. Anyway. Tony Schiavone was in the ring and called out hangman Adam Page to talk about our friend Twinkle Toes. And of course, Adam Page comes out and barely gets started. And thank thankfully, he didn't have more time because he was going to talk, oh, I've I failed before and I've been unsure of myself and blah, blah, blah. This same bullshit. Heroes and stars and champions and fuck, et cetera, are not unsure of their selves, and they don't admit when they've failed in the past, because they didn't fail, they got screwed, they got cheated by the heel. They didn't fail. They've made this fucking guy a sad, drunken milksop. So anyway, he barely got started, and out came Don Callis with the Hardly Boys, Twinkle Toes, McFinger, Bang, Luke Gallows. At least Anderson didn't come out. He was still probably embarrassed at his match with Moxley earlier. And of all people, Pie Face, Pie Face Buck goes in and stands up Adam Page's face and buries him. Just talks about him being a sad, lonely drunk. And then... Page nails pie face. Boom, down he goes. You're not doing enough justice to how bad he was on the mic in there. When he got in there and it's just like, I don't like in their heads, I'm sure it's like, this will be great, but it's so badly done in the ring. Like, hey, it's good to see you. We haven't seen you. Like the whole bad acting. And Matt Jackson is the most counterproductive person in the entire business on the microphone because he makes people, I think, want to just turn him off. He sucks. And the, I will admit the clothes are getting heat. All the stuff they're wearing is getting heat, but have you noticed the Don Callis is the only one wearing normal adult men's clothing, and he's the manager. Yeah, he's the only one trying to pick up a woman. Well, but still, hey, I did pretty good even wearing all my outlandish colors. Point is, the manager is supposed to be wearing all the outlandish shit. <laughs> the fucking Callis looks like he's making an attempt at being well-dressed and professional, and the rest of them look like a goddamn... You know, fucking, uh, uh, I, I'm so frazzled I can't form a cogent simile. How about goddamn uh, a, a break at a fucking child's daycare center? They're all fucking running around in goddamn children's clothing, and they're the ones that are supposed to be the goddamn wrestlers, and the manager looks normal. Callus looks like a penis with a suit on. <laughs> Hey, for heaven's sake, I'll have you know that's a blade scar, not uh, his circumcision <laughs> scar up there on his forehead. Anyway, so 
So then, as you met, as I mentioned, Paige nails pie face. Harpo comes in to attack Paige from Wait, behind. It, what? I have to jump in here. Remember what we said months ago? It may have been six months ago about the eventual Adam Page project to get him the championship. Right. That eventually it would come down to these guys saying, what a drunk you've become. How awful you've become. And he's going to have to clean up his life to be able to rise to the top of AEW. That's exactly what they're doing. So Harpo was going to attack Adam Page from behind, but the dork order hit the ring and the world champion of AEW, the most protected belt in the industry, ran from the dork order. Then Page challenges for a match. Then Twinkle Toes starts talking in his very best breathy phone sex voice. And he agrees to a 10-man elimination tag team match with the Elite versus the Dork Order. But then Page turns around and makes his own stipulation. If they win, he gets his title shot and Dork Order gets a tag title shot. And this was all taking forever. People were just starting to chant cowboy shit now because they like Paige and they like the phrase cowboy shit, which, by the way, thankfully, they remember it since they started it a year ago on this TV and nobody's remembered it since. But this the promo was taken forever and they're making up their own matches and their own stipulations and it's WWE garbage where the guys are just allowed to go out and speak on their own. No interviewer, no announcer running the show, no authority figure coming out to bless these matches and actually make them and validate them. The guys are just making up their own shit. It looked like the South Park episode on wrestling where they go out and emote. And then... Olivier gets in the ring alone with all of the baby faces and gets up in Paige's face and makes his stipulation. If they, if they win, if his team wins and Paige can't have his title shot and the dorks can't have a tag title shot. And then they all just leave. There's no authority figure. They're making their own deals. This went on for fucking ever. And it's embarrassing to sit there and look at the guy who's supposedly the world champion for this company and the guy that's supposed to be his top challenger, the way they're building him up. And you've got these job guys with the masks and the Sharpie marks and the, and the goofy looks and no bodies and the bucks out there in their ridiculous outfits. And it's just, it's a clown show. And this was the longest segment of the night. It wouldn't end. And when you thought it was going to end, they kept it going and... It's like they had an idea, and I'm not justifying the idea. They had an idea of where they wanted to go, but I guess there was no agent. I, I don't know how you agent a Young Buck segment. There was no one there that could sit down and say, here's a way we can get there in less than eight minutes with leaving the ring and coming into the ring and ult- more guys coming out there. It is interesting. The idea that Paige's run for the title is going to be based around the idea that he gave up alcohol and he's become clean, a very... Young Bucks prudish kind of booking thing, but there was so much heat December of 2019, that Dork Order Young Bucks episode of, remember it, of Dynamite, where the Young Bucks beat up the, where the Young Bucks got beat up, excuse me, yes. by the Dork Order and everyone. Yeah, all the, all the phony stuff and everything. All the AEW fans went crazy. They brought up the, all of a sudden it was, you guys won't get a tag title shot. I didn't know they were asking for one. I hope we're not going to get the dork order and the bucks. They're going to finally get to do the program they wanted to do a year and a half ago. Two well, years no, ago. I could, no, they're not going to do a program. They're just going to, because the bucks have to wrestle almost every week. So they're going to have to fucking wrestle these guys sooner or later. You know, it's just FTR that we only get to see once every four months. You think that's intentional? I mean, that's, that's a of Hogan. Course. That's a Hogan move, isn't it? I'm going to bring in the yes. guy that other people say is the best. And then we're never going to let him wrestle on TV. <laughs> yes. We'll make sure that nobody's saying he's the best. Once we get finished with him, you don't bring in the best in the world at what they do and then hide them when you've got this subpar outlaw mud show group on TV every week, but the guys that actually can wrestle anybody, work with anybody, and probably teach all those guys something if they'd listen, they're never seen on television. No, of course not, because 
everybody, and rightfully so, was saying, no, it's ridiculous that people are saying that the Young Bucks are the greatest tag team in the world because there's FTR. There, in plain sight, is someone that's obviously, demonstrably, incredibly better than you are. So they bring them in, give them some money, send them off to the corner and hide them. Now there's nobody better. Yeah, if they, if they don't wrestle, they can't be the best tag team in exactly. wrestling. Yeah, smart. Uh, Officer Bar Brady had a busy night. Now he's with Jericho in the back and talking about MJF's five labors of Hercules challenge. Now they're going into Greek mythology. Uh, he was doing a decent promo when suddenly Sean Spears <laughs> comes in. The camera is on Chris Jericho. They're in a room. The cameraman is standing six or seven feet tops away from Jericho. And they're in a, a, a obviously an indoor room, yet Jericho cannot see Sean Spears with a chair coming at him from the side until it's too late. And Spears hits Jericho in the throat with the point of the chair. Jericho starts overacting, coughing, and choking. Bar Brady, as soon as... Uh, a 200-something-pound man comes in and hits the fucking guy that Bar Brady is interviewing in the throat with a chair, and Bar Brady turns around and just walks out quietly without saying a word. And then Spears holds Jericho down while MJF comes in and cuts a promo on him. This was not just phony. This was egregiously phony. He snuck up on him, Brian in a room with just two people in it, plus a cameraman and Jericho looking at everybody. <laughs> he snuck up on him. At least Spears looks better wearing something on his head instead of seeing his hair. Looked more yeah, in intimidating. That case, I, in that case, I wish he'd give him a mask gimmick so we wouldn't have to see his face either. Yeah, there's nothing else I could add here. Uh, like I've said before, they've kind of beaten any fandom of MJF out of me. We'll see what happens in the future once he could finally, if he's ever able to get past Jericho, because I'm starting to think Jericho won't let him go. If he's ever able to get past Jericho, I can't wait to see what he's going to do after this. Well, there you go. And straight off of Raw in 2002, the next match, Matt Hardy versus Christian Cage. And they were smart. I'll give them this. They were smart. They took put this at the top of the 9 o'clock hour. They had both guys in the ring at 8.58. So when people switching around looking for something at the top of the hour, there are the two of the only actual names that most non-current fans would know on this program, and they're in the ring. So that was smart. And, I mean, this match would have been better 20 years ago because they'd have both been 20 years younger, but as it was, both these guys know how to work. They're professionals, their names. It wasn't ridiculously phony crazy silly stupid whatever from the the opening they started with the lockup they held it they rolled through the ropes to the floor i've seen all this done with a little more oomph by younger men <laughs> recently um christian even jumped off the top with a double sledge to the floor on hardy but they weren't doing dives repeatedly um there was that nice thing where hardy ddt'd christian in, into the steps and he took that move very well um you know these guys can have a match they've been booked so goofy that i don't care most people don't care except the people that as you mentioned that are, that are there and love anything but it wasn't nothing wrong with it christian can still do the frog splash hardy did a big superplex off the top got a two and a half count they went back and forth and then all of a sudden they milked a count out on Christian Cage again. Previous matches on the program, they've been on the floor for minutes at a time. The referee does nothing. But now Christian's laying there. The referee gets to nine, and suddenly Christian rolls in. Matt goes to grab him. Christian grabs him, hits his finish. Boom, out of nowhere, one, two, three. Okay, he goes from almost not being able to get back in the ring to instantly just grabbing the guy that's on offense and hitting him with his finish. And one, two, three. It was a little abrupt, but there's a lot bigger problems in most of the matches in on this program. So 
you know, it was what it was. And then the Hardy, Hardy heels hit the ring, but before they can do anything, here comes Jungle Boy and Dino Douche, and they hit the ring and the heels powder with no contact. So they had to have a run in, even after just a regular singles match, but at least nobody got in a fight. Ah. It was what it was. This wasn't Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly, but it wasn't insulting. I guess that's we, we lower the bar for AEW. So in the land of the Lollipop Guild, this wasn't insulting. All right. Are you going to? Uh, I thought I, it sucked. I thought I, I was about. To, I was waiting for that. I thought it sucked. I, I think thought, yes, because you you can't stand Matthew. Uh, and and uh, and you're not real warm on Christian anymore. Well, I don't even think that has anything to do with it. I think Christian is someone who I was excited to see what they would do with, and now I don't give a crap what they do with him because I've seen what they've done with him. Matt Hardy sucks. I'm sorry. You and I will disagree all day. I know you've done things with him in the past, and you liked him in the past. I've always seen him as Jeff Hardy's brother on the apron. That's it. I've never seen him as anything more than that. I think he keeps trying to reinvent himself. To me, it doesn't matter. Matt Hardy is, you see Matt Hardy, there's certain wrestlers that pop up on your screen. You're like, you know, let me go to the bathroom or let me go outside and smoke a joint or let me go to the kitchen and see if there's an apple. He's just one of those guys that I'll never go like, oh man, a Matt Hardy segment. Well, you better watch out. If you don't stop it, people are going to be mad at you talking about Matt Hardy like that. You know, he's valuable to this company if, if for no other reason than all of his many millions of millions of followers that his wife has on social media that hang on her every word will watch this program if he's on it. Do you remember what Dana White said about um, Tito Ortiz and Jenna Jameson when they were together as a couple? I don't, but I hope you'll elucidate me. Double idiot power. (laughs) Moving on. Tony Schiavone in the ring with Dr. Britt Baker. Okay, (sighs) she's grown on me again. Remember when they first started, I said, why are they not making her the women's champion? She's a a nice-looking lady. She can work. She is a professional. She can do PR. She's a dentist. She should be one of the faces of their company as the female face because she's Obviously, as I just said, attractive and professional and an accomplished dentist and an accomplished wrestler, you can market this. Instead, they go with more of Twinkle Toes' fetish objects and bury Britt Baker as a babyface. Then they turn her heel, and her first interview on television was abysmal. They left her twisting in the wind on a live interview that she couldn't do because she didn't have any experience in it. And then she slowly, and well, actually not even slowly, she pretty quickly picks it up and gets better as a heel. And I said, well, she's got something now as a heel, and they start pushing her, and then they put her in that tooth and nail match with Big Swole, the world's worst wrestling name. And it was so insulting to anybody who has ever been a professional in the wrestling industry that I instituted the tooth and nail rule and would never watch anything involving any of the people that were involved in that ever again. So I didn't see a lot of Britt Baker stuff. Then everybody said, oh, it's so good, it's so good, she's so great. So I I, I came back and I watched the Britt Baker match with her and Thunder Rosa where they used gimmicks and fucking thumbtacks and blood and juice. And that, uh, even though I've been able to, uh, by that point, recognize that Britt Baker was doing great heel promos, I said this was an insulting fucking piece of shit that they let the girls have weapons and juice and blood and thumbtacks and cages and all this other shit, because then what do the guys have to do? But then every time I watch Britt Baker talk, I get back into her because she's an amazing heel promo. However, now. She's turning back babyface because not only the little subliminal things like the thing with her and Tony Schiavone, whatever the fuck that people, the AEW apologists are like, well, Tony's always been friends and they've always jousted. 
No, the announcer does not give the fucking heel a big hug when they come in the ring, whether they're male or female. For the for the interview, when they come in the ring, they don't get a big hug from the announcer. Not if they're a heel. Never. Even Lance Russell didn't hug Lawler when he was a heel. And Lance looked at Lawler like a son. But then Britt does this great promo. And now she's the formerly bloody, tough, goes through the table girl. And she's cutting these promos that are pretty good and with decent material. And she's got some personality. Unlike most of the other people in this company, now the people are like, and she's fighting Nyla Rose and Vicky Guerrero that neither one of them could say shit if they had a mouthful. Nyla Rose's promos are just monoton monotonic and monotonous and robotic, and Vicky's are just screeching and saying nothing. I, I'm the only thing I can't figure out is does Tony Khan know that Britt Baker is now turning into a huge baby face and is already halfway there? And is he going to go with that? Or is he going to fight against the tide and try to keep her as a heel when nobody is going to boo her because she's been allowed to do all this bloody stuff and got over with that segment of society that likes the bloody girls matches. This is, the psychology of this is so fucked, I can't even begin to... And then she does this great promo in the ring live, and then Vicky and Nyla are watching her on the monitor, and they turn around and immediately answer her in one of the most horrible and phony promos of the entire show. So instead of ending on the high note of Britt Baker, we have to... Oh, I forgot, it's all phony, and they don't really mean this. And... I never saw a lot of Vicky stuff in the WWF. I'm sure you did. Was it better than this? It was this. But she was a GM, not a manager, for the most part. So it was just her constant. It was, you know what? It was worse. And that says something. Because it was her constantly coming out on stage screaming, excuse me. At least she's not doing that. She did. But how did she get to be the general manager in WWE? In kayfabe or out of kayfabe? <laughs> no, if she, no, I'm, I'm saying, what, how did they explain that? If she's just some heel and the wife of a fucking former superstar, how did they appoint her all the way to be the general manager? I'm not sure. At one point, they had an empty podium as the general manager, so I'm really not sure what qualifications So then, then they downgraded need. to Vicky Guerrero. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, not, I'm sure, you know what? I'm sure she's a wonderful lady. I've never met her. I was obviously met Eddie numerous times. But I never met his wife because that's back when you didn't bring your wife and family to the matches most of the time. And I'm not saying she's a rotten person. But they booking her in matches. I'm surprised she didn't get hurt. She's never been a trained wrestler. She's now 51 or 2, the fans looked up and said, because I said she's old enough to be Andre's mother, and turns out she is. And... I thought she was a manager in the WWE. So I thought, okay, now they've got an old WWE manager. She was the general manager, not a ta not a wrestling manager. That's even worse. She was the one putting the matches together in kayfabe. Uh, point is, she's not a trained promo, and she's not a trained wrestler. She's a name off the other television. But what is she supposed to be doing here? This... Uh, Anyway, and they got her over Britt Baker tremendously by being, I don't even think it's the bloody match. I just think it's the heel persona and the interviews. She's been one of the best interviews in the entire business. Certainly one of the best in AEW. Yeah. And now they put her in front of a live crowd and they love it. So, I mean, yeah. you can't ever act like a baby face because they won't like her. But if she's acting like a heel, a snotty bitch on promos, no, you know, disrespect, but that's the yeah. character. If you're acting like that. Then they'll then like they're her. gonna like her, and then they yeah. cut in with a promo with the other heels. So naturally, she can't be a heel because who's gonna oh, boo her no. against Vicky Guerrero and Nyla Rose? No one. <sighs> this whole show is put together like a thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle of a polar bear in a blizzard. Well, it's it's a segment by segment show, and what I mean is, like in Mid South Wrestling, there were matches, and then there were commercial breaks. But sometimes during the next match, oftentimes during the next match, they would reference other important things that are happening or happened previously on the show 
They don't just move on like, okay, we're starting fresh now. We're back from the commercial break. Here's a whole new series of problems that have nothing to do with anyone else you've seen already on the show. <laughs> Here's a whole new series of problems. Well, I'll tell you, I didn't have any problems with the next match. It was Wheeler, Utah with Pockets and Hatchet Head Taylor versus Sammy Guevara. And I fast forwarded this quickly because I was scared that they wouldn't have a girls match on this program that I could skip. So I took this opportunity. And then we saw Tony Schiavone with QT Marshall, Comodato, and Solo, but Noah Gogo. In another backstage interview, they're talking about Cody. I guess they're still not finished with Cody. Um, Can you imagine? Let me just stop you right there, just in terms of, unless there was really some business to be done here, Cody is now clearly installed in this feud with Malachi Smith Give AEW credit in two weeks. Malachi Smith? Ma what's, I said that last time, too. Malachi Black. Malachi I don't know why I keep wanting to assign him to the Smith family. They got him in this feud with Malachi Black. And in two weeks, everyone knows who's the good guy. Everyone knows who's the bad guy. Everyone saw Arn get put down. Why would we even be referencing the QT feud anymore? Why even drag Cody down to that if he's doing this? Makes well, no sense. No, there was a reason because QT had to be out there to pour the fucking thermos of coffee on Tony Schiavone's head. Now, there's the feud I want. Schiavone versus QT. Yes, because that was the whole thing. QT said, he actually said these words. This is a quote. You think I'm buried by the golden shovel Cody holds? <laughs> <laughs> like, that would be a natural statement that people... And then he poured a thermos of coffee on poor Tony Schiavone's head. So let's just browbeat and heckle and pester and hester and bother the announcers all we can and make them meaningless because after all why would you want anybody to have any confidence in your salesman there they need to be just as big of a fucking comedy figure as everybody else that should be cody's new nickname the golden shovel the golden shovel <laughs> cody rose <laughs> Well, next up, I got what I wished for. A girls match. The virgin Penelope Ford took on the returning Yuka Sakazaki. Kenny Olivier's fetishes are now allowed back in the country after the pandemic restrictions. And now we get to see every little Japanese schoolgirl wearing their doilies. This one, she was in a genie outfit. Little... Of uh, silk genie pants and things and such. This was 10 minutes of national television time. Penelope Ford and Yuka Sakazuki. Then we were ready for the main event. Mr. Sunshine himself, Justin Roberts, the introduction of the coffin match. Go ahead, you were going to say something? Well, just to reference the previous match, not that we wanted to see a match there, a woman's match there or anything else. But just in terms of the women's division, you have Britt Baker. You do an angle with her, a promo with her. You have all these other women in this division. I can't remember the last time Penelope Ford won a match. Now she's losing a match to someone we haven't seen. I don't even remember Yuka, but I guess she was there before. She beats Penelope Ford now. Why? Like of all what the are, women are there, you saying that Nyla Rose should have gotten a win because she's wanting to cha challenge the women's champion? Nyla Rose like or that? whoever's after Nyla Rose. And if it's Yuka, give me a break. Five foot two, 102 pounds. If it's Yuka, I'm going to puka. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Let's puka Yuka. It's Kenny Olivier's Japanese schoolgirl fetishes. That's more important than doing business here, Brian. Don't you understand that? There's plenty of girls that could be in this spot that might be a challenge for Britt Baker or might actually appeal to an American audience, but instead we have interchangeable Japanese schoolgirls wearing fetish outfits because Twinkle Toes gets his taint tickled by those type of things. Anyway, the main event, as I mentioned, the big introduction of the coffin match, Justin Roberts, I thought he was 6'2". Apparently people are saying he's only like 5'10". So it's even worse that he took that fat asshole and stretched him the other week um 
six pallbearers carry out the coffin that they're incredibly careful not to call a casket because I'm sure that's trademarked. And the coffin match here is Darby Allen and the other page. And of course, there's horrible jealousy and hatred and animosity amongst these two guys. That's why Darby Allen skateboarded down the ramp for his coffin match. It, God damn, in this company, the dynamic dudes might have gotten over. It doesn't matter what the the uh, the context or what the situation, as long as some guy with funny hair and his face half painted is riding a skateboard, that's all that matters to these people. Don't you think at one, since the guy's been trying to kill Darby Allen, he might have been a little more serious, one would have thought. But nevertheless... An immediate jump start. Who could have seen that coming? Darby Allen flies right in there and boom. And as soon as he jumps on the other page, then he takes off his T-shirt and he had what looked like a homemade suit of armor top that he might have hammered out of a baking sheet and made with black duct tape strapped to his back. Did I describe that as close as we're going to get verbally to what that was? He was wearing a shield like Bret Hart did when Goldberg gave him the spear in Canada. And I guess with Darby, you would expect that he would make something like that himself. Did it look that hokey when Bret was wearing it? Not as hokey, no. Okay. Well, then he gave the other page a leaping body block with his back with the shield on it the metal and then took that off and threw it away and we never saw it again so for one fucking spot he comes in wearing this fucking thing and then takes it off of his own volition and never uses it again then he opened the coffin so he could put the other page in the coffin but scorpio sky the other page's partner was in the coffin and he jumps out and nails darby allen so then Sting comes out, not running, mind you, walking with purpose, and Sting at 62 years old with a blank look on his face proceeds to kick the teetotal shit out of Scorpio Sky, 30 years younger, in a, look a lot better shape. And did you notice when Sting threw Sky over the rail, remember conversations we've had over the past couple of weeks about why you don't fight out in the crowd because people it's a lawsuit, liability, people are going to get hurt? Anybody that wants to, go back and watch Sting throw Scorpio Sky over the rail and look at the fan that both of Scorpio Sky's feet missed his face by inches. That guy, if, if he'd have leaned in a little bit, he could have owned half of Tony Khan's fucking pro sports franchises. Anyway, so Sky and Sting go into the arena. They're fighting in the arena. They're fighting in the fucking aisleways. They're fighting in the general admission seats. While there's nothing happening in the actual match that's going on in the ring, the other page is unscrewing one of the turnbuckles and loosening the bottom rope. And then finally, the match actually starts happening again. Darby Allen throws the other page over the rail into the crowd, and the other page barely missed a guy dressed like Jesus Christ. They went from all elite Scooby-Doo to all elite Jesus Christ. Anyway, so they they were lucky. They didn't. They had two cracks at getting a good lawsuit, and they didn't achieve either one. And during the break. Picture in picture, in the whole break, they just wandered around, quote unquote, fighting in the arena bleachers and the stairs and on the floor. But they were in just in one place forever and doing the fucking eh, kind of walking fighting or eh, kind of choking on the rail fighting. But they spent the whole goddamn break up in the arena. And by the time they come back, the other page is throwing the metal sta ring stairs into the ring and bouncing Darby Allen off the stairs. He takes the turnbuckle that they've loosened, hooked it in Darby Allen's chain he wears around his neck and jerked it and broke the chain. That was actually a good spot because I've been wanting somebody to do that because the last thing you ever do is wear any kind of fucking necklace in a wrestling match unless you want to break your fucking neck. Uh, but all this reads more violent than it looked because it looked it it reads violent and it looked silly. 
especially when Darby Allen takes the turnbuckle and fish hooks the other page in his mouth with the turnbuckle or whatever. Um, the other page rolled out of the ring into the coffin, but you got to close the lid, remember? So he brings Darby Allen in with him, and he, they have a big one-two exchange in the coffin. Still, nobody can throw a punch. And then the other page backdrops Darby Allen out of the coffin, a full backdrop, flat of his back onto the floor. Uh, of course, he didn't sell it. The other page somehow got busted open hard way in all this sloppiness that was going on. Who knows what or how. And then they get back in the ring, and there's the metal stairs sitting in the middle of the ring. And they did some contrived spots over and off of where, you know, they were jumping off or were rolling over or whatever. You can tell that at one point, the other page had to roll onto the steps and then scooch over by himself when Darby Allen was climbing to the top rope. But then the other page jumps up, grabs Darby Allen, and gives him a full razor's edge off the top rope, flat of his back onto the metal stairs in the middle of the ring. And he landed hard. And I was willing to say, okay, that will be the finish. Because how could it not be? But as the other page takes Darby Allen over to the apron, he instead of just throwing him in the ca coffin, he tried to suplex him off the apron. And this is within 15 seconds of this razor's edge off the top rope onto the metal stairs, flat of his back that Darby Allen took. And as the other page goes for a suplex off the apron, Darby Allen flips behind him, gets on his back on offense like nothing has ever happened, is perfectly fine, bumps fucking page, goes and gets his skateboard, goes to the top rope, and while pay, while the other page is leaned out through the ropes, kind of hanging head first out of the ring over the middle rope, Darby Allen, like this would be a, a thing that would even do damage to somebody more than anything else you could do. Darby Allen jumps off the top rope, quickly puts his skateboard underneath his feet and acted like he skated over the other page's back. He could have just taken the skateboard and hauled off and caved his fucking head in with it, swing it like Paul Bunyan, and he wouldn't hurt himself. But instead, he goes to the top to do something that wouldn't be as damaging to his opponent and almost killed himself in the process. So now that I have seen Darby Allen come back to life after being razor's edged onto the metal stairs off the top rope 15 seconds earlier, I'm reaching for the remote to turn this piece of fucking shit off because I've had enough because that's even more ridiculous than the second rope tombstone pile driver. But whoa, you think it's more ridiculous than the I think the tombstone pile driver is more egregious than that. Jumping I, from the second rope to the middle of the ring with a pile driver? A 140-pound guy thrown from eight feet in the air halfway across the ring, flat of his back onto metal that doesn't give at all. And plus, it's, it's, he's not a grown man. At least it was MJF and Guevara. They, they're close to fucking 200 pounds. This kid is fucking emaciated. He's a goddamn anorexia case i don't i don't know which is worse anyway i was going to try to turn it off but the skateboard across the back was the finish then, then he, so this guy gets razors edged off the top rope onto the stairs 15 seconds later he's back up kicking the other guy's ass jumps off the top with a skateboard to his back and then throws him in the coffin and closed the lid that was the finish so i couldn't turn it off fast enough but i also saw this after he wins the match and dipshit, Mr. Karate Man, the other page, is in the coffin with the lid closed. Darby Allen goes and turns the coffin around, climbs back up to the top rope, and does a coffin drop, his little back drop thing where he just leans backward, takes the trust fall, off the top rope to the coffin that's on the floor and through the fucking lid of the coffin on top of the other page. What the fuck is the matter with this guy and why do they let him do these things? 
Not only did it make no sense, you've already finished the guy off, you've already won the match, and he's in the coffin. When you coffin drop a coffin, you're going to fuck yourself up. But because they had the balsa wood coffin that he went through the fucking lid, he literally landed on the other page who you could tell had turned over sideways and was covering up because he knew what was coming. But he still landed on it, not only landed on it, but all the sharp edges of that wood. This guy's a fucking moron. He's going to kill so I don't care if he hurts himself anymore, Darby Allen, because he's trying, and eventually he's going to succeed. But in the process of paralyzing himself, this fucking goof is going to kill somebody else. He's going to hurt some innocent people. I will say two more things, and then I will let you talk, and I don't care if I ever speak about this fucking match again. Number one, why do the opponents go for this shit? What is the matter with them? What is their mental fucking issue? In any locker, I have been around the biggest stars in the history of professional wrestling. Anybody from Ric Flair to Dusty Rhodes to The Undertaker to Steve Austin to The Rock, etc. Go back even further and then you go in the days of the 70s. And the fucking greats. I've talked to many of them. I've been in the locker room with many of them. I've worked with many of them. I cannot think of one individual that's ever drawn money in the wrestling business that you could go up to them and say, okay, here's the finish. You're going to take that guy right there. You're going to pick him up off the top rope and give him a razor's edge off the top rope onto those ungiving metal stairs. And then you're going to try to throw him in that coffin. But before 15 seconds elapses, he's going to drop behind you, make a comeback, and throw you in the coffin. Everybody that I've ever known that I just described would have said, you got to be out of your fucking mind. That's not going to happen. If I give that guy razor's edge on the fucking stairs... He's going to be hospitalized. I'm going to be talking about it and crowing about it for six weeks or else why is that move's not going to happen? And I'm not going to look like a goddamn weak, pissy ass bitch just because you've got a fantasy of this finish in your mind. No star, no self-respecting professional wrestler would give anybody that bump if they were told the guy's going to make a comeback 15 seconds later, because that makes you look like a weak piece of shit. Second thing I said I was going to say, if you told any of those people that I just talked about, the large box office attractions, major stars in wrestling, if you said, okay, you're going to be in this coffin, And this guy is going to get up on the top rope while the lid's closed and you're in it, and he's going to dive off the top rope and crash through the lid of the coffin backwards where he can't even see what the fuck's going on, and he's going to land on top of you because the lid is going to break. Brian, how long do you think it would have taken any of those people to pick their bag up, pull their car keys out of their fucking pocket, and walk out? It would have probably taken a little while because they probably would have been laughing thinking it wasn't real. I will give you that. And then, and it wouldn't be because, oh no, I'm not going to let him do that and hurt himself. It would be, no, I don't give a fuck whether this idiot wants to paralyze himself and put himself in the hospital, but I'm in that coffin. If he's going to land on the lid, that's fine. If the lid's going to break and he's going to come in with me, fuck you. Oh God. But they just do it. And act like there's nothing wrong with it. Act like that it doesn't make them look professionally like feckless fucking idiots. I love that word feckless. And like personally, it doesn't endanger them that they won't be able to fucking work and earn a living because of somebody else has a death wish and wants to take all these fucking bumps. If you know to, if you go back in the late 80s, all the bumps that Mick was taken. None of them were against top guys unless he was taking them and being given them and taking them, not giving them to somebody else because nobody was going to take that shit then. Because let's face it, and to be honest, it was kind of, it was Mick's way of either getting over or killing himself one or the other, and nobody wanted to be involved in it. 
It was okay for him to take those bumps. That was on the office, but it, the opponents were not going to be cooperating in that shit. I mean, did, you, did what thoughts did you have on this thing? I, I just, I don't know what the fuck they're all, all of them are thinking. I like both guys. I didn't like the match at all. I didn't like the setup for the match at all. I've liked Ethan Page from what I've seen of him so far. I think he exudes a great heel charisma in the ring. I've liked him on promos. His facials are good. I just don't like anything they did to set up this match. Referencing things that happened years ago in other promotions, and I have no idea what they're talking about. If there's one guy in that company that's going to do stupid shit and risk hurting himself, I'm not even going to talk about hurting others. I'm okay with it being Darby. Because I think you believe him. You believe that he is that stupid guy who's going to do something stupid to hurt himself. I, I'll go along with that. He's the only guy there that fucking lays in his dives. He did it again here. Yeah. He's the yeah. only guy there. When he dives, you think he's really hitting someone. Because he is. I mean, he looks really good when he does that. He's committed to it. I'm okay with him being the one freak show act there, for lack of a better term. And he's over. That doesn't mean I like this match. Doesn't mean I can excuse how they set up the finish. I didn't like the match. And I wish they were doing something different. But I'm okay with Darby being that guy there. Because I think, it's, okay. I think I it said, works for him. I'm okay with Darby if he wants to paralyze himself. Let him. But he's going to hurt somebody else. Because nobody in this company has the, the, the word no in their vocabulary. And any stupid, dangerous ridiculous spot that they can think of they're going to do it to get a pop from the crowd that's already there and they're not going to make a penny extra and it just makes it harder for anybody else to actually do an angle where some top talent might be injured how how can your stars be injured by shit that 140 pound guys on the card don't even sell so you know, Sabu, There's where we were with that. In the early 90s, when Sabu, after his matches, got his reputation for doing the moonsaults through the table, there was no opponent. It was just him moonsaulting himself through the tables over and over again. And then, then everybody started laughing. Why is he mad at the furniture? What's wrong? Why is he mad at the table? That was stupid, too. But it was, you know, it wasn't as stupid as all of this. <sighs> well, with that said, a lot of people really like Dynamite this week, apparently. Yeah, apparently. That's what I'm saying. They're training this, this cult that they have, that this is what wrestling's supposed to be. And since they, they've never seen it done right, they laugh at the idea that it could be taken seriously because they've never seen that. And the, the talent in AEW is so anxious to let them know that it's all bullshit and it's all phony and we're all just having fun that they come there to laugh at wrestling and that's a mortal insult to me and always will be which is why i'm disgusted by these people and and i knew this was going to happen they're going to teach a certain segment of the population mostly younger people that this kind of shit's acceptable in the name of pro wrestling and I've spent all of my life fighting wrestling's enemies, and I will continue to do so, except now the enemy is us. The promoters are the enemies of the wrestling business. Well, some would argue, some in the business would argue, it's always been that case, but, you know, the one interesting thing, I didn't watch SmackDown, but SmackDown had fans there, and this, is, of course, was dynamite, not just with fans, but outside of Jacksonville. I heard SmackDown had a really hot crowd. How long do you think the crowds would stay, if it's artificially hot just because they're happy to have entertainment, how long do you think that would maintain? Well, it, de it depends. It's not like that everybody is getting the live entertainment all in the same week. So every time that they go for the next weeks and weeks to buildings, it's going to be the first time that those people have seen live Major League Wrestling in however long so i think you're the hot crowds are going to stick around live because they're not at the shows every week but the the novelty of actually seeing people go batshit for the home viewer may wear off in you know in some time and it, it but it's it's a great atmosphere it's the old time atmosphere so it looks good on tv right now for any company 
But I don't think the live crowd is going to lose their enthusiasm soon because it's still new to them. It's, it's the only live show they've been to in their town for however long. I, I think the TV people will start to get used to it, or TV viewers will start to get used to it again a little more quickly. But the AEW crowd ain't going to change. They screamed and yelled at whatever Falderall was going on at the shows before, and they're going to do the same thing. Because for whatever reason, they can't see through this shit, and they like what they're doing. It's just insulting to those of us who have dedicated ourselves to the wrestling business. You said it already. When you say for some reason they can't see through it, you have a bunch of people who grew up watching WWE Raw over the last 20 years. So even if you're an improvement on Raw and still insulting the fans of wrestling, it's all you know. It's all, You know, they're trying to do the better Raw. They're not trying to do the better Mid-South. <laughs> they're trying to do the better Raw. Well, if they've set their standards and their bars and their aspiration that low, maybe they'll actually succeed then. If you're just trying to do a better wrestling show than Raw, it shouldn't be hard. But the problem is, as we mentioned, and as we just went through that list, at least the WWE has a bunch of people that look like wrestlers. That's what's missing from AEW. It's like watching the trained chimpanzees do human things. It's cute. Oh, look at that chimpanzee smoking a cigarette, just like a real person. It's cute for some people watching these kids imitate real adult grown pro wrestlers, but that only goes so far. Anyway, I'm about done with this whole topic for today. How about you? Yeah, I think so. All righty. Tune in for the drive through and we'll answer some questions and play some music and come back next week and we will... uh We'll have more roster news and more historical tidbits and, unfortunately, some more modern wrestling as well and all kinds of good stuff. It depends on who does what stupid in the next week as to what we'll talk about. Anyway, otherwise than that, it's been free and easy or cheap and sloppy. Hopefully, you've made your decision. Until we see you and hear from you again, thank you and fuck you and bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>